y'all, Scott here, and my review of E3 2017 and it's hot off the presses. So off the presses, in fact, that I had to resort to using this pre-made intro I made years ago back in 2013. Now I hope that doesn't kill the immersion for you. Getting a review out of E3 2017 and this quickly required some setbacks. And now onto the segment where I disclose my opinion. I was disappointed in E3 2017. There was a lot riding on every company at E3 2017. Microsoft had to prove the worth of Project Scorpio, Sony had to prove that the aging PS4 could combat whatever Microsoft had to show, and Nintendo had to justify the millions of purchased Nintendo Switches, plus convince more people that it's totally worth it. We're going to be taking a look at the press conferences of E3 2017. I know that all the companies revealed some things before and after their showcases, but let's keep it simple and point and laugh at the big stuff. The first conference of E3 2017 was EA's on Saturday, June 10th. Doesn't matter what game they're selling here, I'm sold. Well, we start off with Madden 18. That's Madden like you've never seen it. Mm. Following Madden, they go straight into Battlefield 1, showing a montage of players online and detailing updates to the game. Next up is FIFA 18, and some blokes from a football show come on stage to promote it. Where do I pre-order? They then go over Need for Speed Payback, which looks pretty solid. But tell me, does it play as well as it looks? I can assure you that plays as well as it looks. Oh, thank God. Transitioning from that, they start talking about EA Originals, which is EA's way of contracting independent developers to create new original experiences. This time, they revealed the game A Way Out from the same developer of Brothers A Tale of Two Sons, and honestly, it looks really interesting, being a story-based co-op game played entirely in split-screen and graphically looking pretty nice. After that, they discuss the power of Project Scorpio and how it'll affect games like Madden, unveil a CG trailer for Bioware's new IP Anthem, talk about NBA Live 18, and then finish it off with a metric six and a half lifetimes worth of Star Wars Battlefront 2 footage. You know what's bad? I watched this press conference after I knew there was nothing for me in it. Overall, while EA's conference didn't personally speak to me really too awful much, it really wasn't supposed to. Now with a few companies this year opting for more of a quicker presentation heavily focused on pre-recorded video, it feels a bit jarring that EA wouldn't opt for this as well. Also, I really think trimming the fat and making it shorter would have made it more appealing to watch for somebody that missed the live broadcast such as myself. However, it wasn't bad, they showed what they had to, and it was pretty painless to watch. Continuing with my E3 press conference rating tradition, I give EA's press conference out of five knee slaps. The next company up is Microsoft on Sunday, June 11th. This year was a big one for Microsoft. They had to convince everybody that Project Scorpio was worth it. And did they do that? Nope. Starting off with a quick video that later reveals Project Scorpio's design, we see a few characters form, including the best Xbox character, Forza. And that is the design for Project Scorpio. It literally looks like a refined Xbox One S and nothing more. Then Phil Spencer comes on stage and reveals Scorpio's true name. There's no power greater than X. And today, we are pre proud to welcome the newest member of the Xbox family, fittingly named Xbox One X. Okay. I mean, I'm not crazy for it, but I don't think it's as bad as others make it out to be. Many compared it to the Wii U's name, and I think that's insulting to the Xbox One X. You see, people thought the Wii U was something like the One X, an upgrade. The Xbox One X isn't an entirely new console, simply a beefed up Xbox One, so I think the name works fine. Plus, if somebody buys an Xbox One S accidentally instead of a One X, it doesn't really matter unless you really care about your games looking better than great because they both play the same games perfectly. They start talking about the specs of this thing, and the audience members are losing it. All right, this kind of irked me. I understand the specs reveal being a big deal for a new computer, for example, but I never got why specs were such a big deal for consoles. Like, I get it. You want games to look the absolute best on your console, but you're more than likely not making games for this thing, so why do you care about the Xbox One X having a six teraflops GPU? As long as the specs are good enough to run the most demanding games on the planet, then why should it matter how many teraflops are lodged in this thing? Hey, Forza has a crossover with Master Chief. Fan service at its finest right here, everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, may I present the 2018 Porsche 911 GT2 RS. Anybody else have the sudden urge to buy an Xbox One X? Metro Exodus is revealed and that gameplay was fake. The setting looked cool, but yeah, fake. Assassin's Creed Origins is up next, and as a not fan of the Assassin's Creed games, as in I haven't really played them, this looks pretty intriguing. I might. 
might give it a shot. Player Unknown's Battlegrounds is revealed to be exclusive to the Xbox One. That's pretty cool, never mind, it's a launch exclusive. That kills a lot of my interest in playing it on the Xbox. Deep Rock Galactic, an interesting graphical style for sure. It's also only a launch exclusive, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. More guns though, after Metro and Battlegrounds, this is getting a little old. And now, State of Decay 2. I loved State of Decay on Xbox 360, so this is definitely on my radar. My god, this trailer was too long. I have a few problems with this trailer. State of Decay 2 isn't the prettiest game out there. Its animations and characters all have a solid amount of jank. That's fine though, as the game isn't really about the story or characters, more so on the survival and exploration aspects. The trailer gives off kind of a Days Gone Last of Us vibe, where they're trying to be super serious and it just doesn't work well when the game doesn't look like those games graphically. The game really isn't about story anyways, trim the trailer down to two minutes or use all this time for a gameplay demo. And look, more guns! For God's sake, Microsoft, we get it, the Second Amendment happened, it's cool, but get over it! I know all these games are totally different, but it's so many games in a row that have the same mechanic. And I know that makes me sound really Anything that's not made by Nintendo is bullshit but they should have shaken up the game trailer so then a string of games whose main mechanic isn't shooting doesn't happen. Whatever this game is, I couldn't care less. It doesn't have a live announcer screaming. Minecraft gets a handful of showtime. I'm not personally interested, and I think this could have all been condensed into a short trailer, but instead, two trailers and a whole speaker. Dragon Ball Fighter Z looks really, really good. Like, really, really, really good. I'm not a Dragon Ball guy, but this game looks perfect for what it is visually, and it honestly looks really fun. Another launch exclusive! This is getting annoying considering how many actual exclusives have been shown off. Yeah, I got nothing. Wow, The Last Night looks gorgeous. I'm kinda getting sick of the whole pixel art style for indie games, but this game takes it in a new direction. Like, my god, it looks great. Reminds me of the game Flashback. Wait, just a moment, what was shown at the beginning of the trailer? Exclusive. Christ! Looks like Microsoft's getting artsy on us. All right, cool, wait, what was at the beginning again? Exclusive. Code Vein, I totally forgot this was in the conference. I have no clue what I was doing during this portion, and thus, I got nothing. See if these gets an extended gameplay demo, and my god, this game still isn't out yet. It looks cool and really fun, turning a lot of pirate tropes into gameplay mechanics like riddles to find treasure and ship battles, but I really think they showed this game off too early. We've been seeing this game at E3 for years now. I liked the gameplay, but I thought it went on for too long. Exclusive. All right, hate to break it to you, Microsoft, but I don't think launch exclusives excite anybody. They're more so an annoyance to people on other platforms and to people on your platform. If they were interested in the game, they would have bought the game regardless of it being a launch exclusive or multi-platform. Tacoma, what the hell was that? No, seriously, I feel like indie game trailers at Microsoft press conferences do the worst job at telling you what their game is like. Like, remember the trailer for Inside last year? What was that? Hey, Conquer! <gasps> you cheekies! Well, here we have Super Lucky's Tale, perfect evidence that you don't have to be Nintendo to make a shitty Nintendo game. To be fair, it looks like it would be fun, but a bit generic. I'd be interested to pick it up on the cheap, but I'm in no way foaming at the mouth to play this game. It is nice to see Microsoft getting behind a decent looking 3D platformer, though. Cuphead, the coolest looking game to ever grace a video file, finally gets a release date it will inevitably not make. Crackdown 3 starring Terry Crews, Neato, and it's coming out the same day as the Xbox One X. That's Neato as well. We get a montage of smaller games, Ashen, Life is Strange Before the Storm, a gameplay demo for Shadow of War, a trailer for Ori and the Will of the Wisp, which is pretty banging, and... Today, I'm pleased to announce an exciting expansion to the program. Yes! This was amazing confirmation. I love the idea that the Xbox One will play all generations of Xbox, and the original Xbox has a killer library that I love to play again on a modern console. This was my favorite announcement of the show. I was so happy. Phil then reveals that the Xbox One X will be retailing for $499, and then we get a gameplay demo for Anthem. We have four more conferences to go over. That was a decent conference. My main problem was the pacing. It felt like too many similar games were lumped together, which made them all kind of blend in. Some trailers, especially for indie games, didn't give you any concrete information on what the game is about, and I would be lying if I said I wasn't bored multiple times during the conference. Just some gameplay demos and trailers dragged on for too long. 
That ended up having the conference be the longest of the bunch, running over 90 minutes, during an E3 where most conferences were under an hour long. Also, Microsoft didn't really do a good job convincing anybody the Xbox One X is worth it. It just felt like a lot of that power is going underutilized, and I'm fine with my Xbox One S. Like, nothing I saw during the conference made me go, well, I can't do that on my current Xbox One. But if you're really that serious about 4K, I guess the X is cool, but for people like me who are fine with regular 720 and 1080p, they didn't do much to convince me, and it's obvious the Xbox One X is more so a luxury product that's marketed towards the die-hard fans. But Microsoft showed a ton of games with a fair amount of variety, which can't be said for other companies at the show. <laughs> Next up is Bethesda, also on Sunday, June 11th, and my god did people hate this conference. It starts up with a montage of Bethesda employees and their families, which is nice. They then transition into the show, which is styled in the vein of 1950s advertising, and I dig it a lot, it's cute. And then they talk about a bunch of old stuff for 30 minutes. Doom, but in VR. Fallout 4, but in VR. Elder Scrolls Online Morrowind, which came out like a week ago. Creation Club, which is for old games like Fallout 4 and Skyrim, and everybody hated this, basically charging for mods. Elder Scrolls Legends Skyrim expansion. Card game, not really interested. Switch version of Skyrim, Zelda content, cool, motion controls, I mean sure, but the game wasn't made for that and nobody will play it like that. No release date, even though this is a port of a 6 year old game announced last October. No release date. Dishonored 2 DLC, cool, Quake Champions, alright, and then we finally get the major new announcements, Evil Within 2 and Wolfenstein 2. That's it. Overall, I didn't really hate this conference like others, I thought it was alright, it's just that they barely announced anything new. Really, only two big things were announced and they were at the very tail end of the conference. I think the reason I didn't hate this thing was because it was really quick and painless, and it also helps that I think the final two game announcements were pretty good. Alas, they didn't do a good job of letting us know what's to come in 2018, and next E3 they better bring out more new games and stop relying so heavily on six year old ones. Next, we have the winner of E3, Ubisoft. What has this world come to? No idea where this came from. Ubisoft time and time again has had a pretty mediocre conference, kind of due to the fact that a lot of their games were always revealed at other conferences. This year, their conference was on Monday, June 12th, and started off with a bang by revealing Mario and Rabbids Kingdom Battle. This was entirely leaked for a solid six years before the reveal, but it was nice to see it finally be confirmed. Miyamoto came up on stage and I thought this section dragged on a tad too long, but I'm okay with it. When you have Miyamoto at your press conference, I can understand milking it for as long as you can. The game itself looks fine. The gameplay didn't really click with me, but other people are genuinely excited for it. I'm not offended by the game, it looks quality enough, I just don't know if it's for me gameplay wise. We then get a quick trailer for Assassin's Creed Origins, which is a game we saw at Microsoft, but they don't linger on it, which is nice. Next is a trailer for The Crew 2, which looked cool, with multiple vehicles racing at the same time, color me intrigued. South Park for the 17th E3 in a row, some artsy VR game called Transference, a new IP, Skull and Bones, which looks really fun. Basically, Ubisoft is satiating the fans of Assassin's Creed 4 Black Flag. Good stuff, but it's a ways off. And what better game to show off next than Just Dance 2018? They don't linger on it, and it's here and gone in no time. Neat. A new South Park mobile game, Phone Destroyer. Alright. Next up is Ubisoft's Toys to Life game, Starlink. From what I understood, you don't have to use the toys, but if you want to, you can put together your own ship with whatever pieces you desire, and it will appear as that in the game, which is pretty cool. Some steep DLC, Far Cry 5 gameplay, which looked really, really good, and then ending it on Beyond Good and Evil 2, one of the most anticipated, long-awaited sequels of all time. Of course, it's weird because the characters swear like every two syllables in the trailer. I think they obviously looked into some marketing research and realized people don't care about talking monkeys if they ain't swearing. That was really weird and it felt a little too forced coming from the T-rated original, but hey, it's still Beyond Good and Evil 2. No gameplay and it's basically just now starting production, but it's cool that Ubisoft formally announced it this way. Yeah, so Ubisoft did really good. I liked how they didn't stay on things too long or try too hard to be funny. They let their developers be developers and showed the games they made and then moved on to the next thing. It was surprisingly really well done and all the games shown off looked quality. The final traditional conference of them all is Sony, is also taking place on Monday, June 12th, later at night. I had a lot of concerns going into Sony's conference. They announced so many games at E3 2016, and most of those games still haven't released. Would we be looking at an E3 with little new content and mainly a rehash of last year? Yeah, pretty much. 
So at E3 2016, I thought Sony did great because of the style of press conference they went for. They started off with a live orchestra playing music that sounded straight out of God of War. Then gameplay started up and revealed that it was the new God of War. After that, non-stop, trailer after trailer, no bigwig coming out to explain what you just saw, just trailer after trailer of new game after new game. I loved it. Sony did a similar thing here, but take out all the excitement of new game announcements and replace them with games we already know about. Instead of a new God of War caliber announcement, the live music was playing for a story trailer of Uncharted The Lost Legacy. Not as impactful, we already know about this game. I'm totally gonna pick it up, but it's more so a standalone expansion for Uncharted 4. It's not a huge, big, exciting way to start off a press conference. Next up was Horizon DLC, which, alright, cool. After that, a gameplay demo of Days Gone, which looks good, albeit a little too much like The Last of Us did well, let's make something like that. Still, it was announced last year and still no release window. Monster Hunter World, which is really cool. Many have complained it's simply westernizing Monster Hunter, but I've heard conflicting reports saying it's way more Monster Hunter than some skeptics say it is. Plus, it'll introduce the series to far more people here in North America, which is great. A from the ground up remake of Shadow of the Colossus. Awesome. This is how I want remakes to be. This looks like if Shadow of the Colossus was made in this generation, and it looks beautiful. Marvel vs. Capcom Infinite Story Trailer, alright cool. Call of Duty World War 2, alright cool. PSVR, alright cool. God of War Trailer, nice to see some hack and slash elements in the game. I liked the demo from last year, but it felt like let's make a Naughty Dog rather than let's make a God of War. Nice to see the game bringing in some elements from the original series, and I like the release date, early 2018. Detroit Become Human. Whatever, I haven't really played any of Quantic Dream games, nor do I have much desire to, so I got nothing. But god, this game still doesn't have a release window yet? Next up, Destiny 2 trailer, and then Sean Layden comes back on stage to close the conference, that's it? Well, we do get a gameplay demo of Spider-Man, and it looks amazing, but seriously, that's it? That was such an underwhelming press conference. It felt like Sony just tried to replicate what they did last year, but forgot to announce any new games. The only new game we got from Sony was a remake of a game that's already been remade. Not to this extent, but still. And the trailers and gameplay demos they did show off didn't really reveal amazing new things. It felt more so like, here's more Days Gone, here's more God of War. The game shown off looked great for the most part, but I gotta say, if you watch Sony's 2016 conference, you don't really have a reason to watch this year's. Finally, we have Nintendo and their Nintendo Spotlight on Tuesday, June 13th. I had a lot to worry about going into this. At E3, I want the most games possible, surely meaning a runtime of around an hour is warranted for the conferences. The Nintendo Spotlight was said to be only 25 minutes and to have a major focus on 2017 games only. I was scared. I wanted to see brand new things and also new looks on games we already knew about. That 25 minute length meant we were either going to get mostly one or the other. Nintendo needs to start off strong, just get into the games, don't waste time on games that are coming out within the month like ARMS or something. Fuck. A short trailer plays showing off the multiplayer games on Switch coming soon, soft revealing Rocket League on the system, which is perfect, that game will work so well on the system, that was awesome. Then Reggie talks for 20 minutes, and for the remaining 5 minutes we start off with Xenoblade Chronicles 2. It looks really good, and while I'm not an RPG fan, I can appreciate this game, and it looks nice. And we get confirmation it's coming this year. Next up, an untitled Kirby game is revealed. It looks beautiful, but a little too generic for my liking. Looked a bit too similar to Return to Dreamland on the Wii. It does have some of its own ideas though, it brings back mixing abilities and has some fun co-op puzzles thrown in there. I'm gonna pick it up, but I wanna see this game garner its own identity soon. Then more talking about stuff that doesn't matter, Pokemon RPG title for the Switch is confirmed only via words, and Metroid Prime 4 is revealed only via a logo. I said something about Metroid at E3, didn't I? Nowadays, before E3 2017, there are rumors that two new Metroid games are going to be revealed. Yeah, I don't buy it. Huh. Listen, these are amazing announcements and I'm excited to see what comes of them, but I would have liked to see at least some concept art or something from these games. Alas, these are two highly anticipated titles that are obviously very early in production, so just mentioning that they're in the works is enough, I guess. Yoshi. Looks weird. I like the world's art style, but why is Yoshi just a regular Yoshi? But he has a weird texture, like he's a plush or something, but doesn't look the part. I hope the Yoshi is just a tent model, and I think that's the case. Hopefully he's replaced with a paper craft version or something to go with the art style that would fit better. I like that it's a 2D platform where you can go forward and backwards. It reminds me of Bug on the Sega Saturn. 
The flip mechanic is neat and is used really creatively. I highly recommend watching the gameplay on Treehouse Live. Our style needs a bit of a tweaking, but overall, looks good. Next up is Fire Emblem Warriors. You see, I'm not a Fire Emblem guy and also didn't really get into Hyrule Warriors, so this game doesn't really interest me. However, I think it's really lame that they're only using characters from the latest entries in the series and the first few entries. Why not the entire series? That's just kind of a slap in the face to longtime fans. Zelda DLC is next and oh my god, we already know about this. They already detailed this online via screenshots, this just feels like padding. And they further detailed the second DLC pack, but barely, they just kind of vaguely show pictures of the champions and say that the pack is about them. They also revealed that the champions are getting their own amiibo, which is cool, I'm happy to see a Zelda character other than Link get an amiibo. Then more talking from Reggie, then games we already knew about. One of my least favorite things ever is the fact that they show off Rocket League like this is a huge reveal and I was squealing, you showed it in the intro, this is old news! So that's the Nintendo Spotlight at E3 2017 and there was really nothing that could possibly redeem it. Nintendo wins! I feel like the 25 minute time limit was more of a detriment than an advantage. I understand that Nintendo wanted to quickly get through everything and whatnot, but it was more so stressful as a Nintendo fan. Knowing they only had 25 minutes made me hate when they would waste their time just talking to the camera or going over stuff we already knew. Kinda lame Metroid Prime 4 and Pokemon were merely just stated to be coming to the Switch with nothing else, but hey I'll take the announcements and sleep well knowing Metroid is back and mainline Pokemon is finally coming to a home console. Mario Odyssey is literally everything the human race has built up to. I cannot say any more good things about that game. The capture mechanic of the hat took a mechanic that was already cool, you know, using the hat as a weapon and platform, and made it that much cooler. Overall, they had great announcements, but I wanted just a bit more of a better look at what 2018 will entail, and I hated the fact it was only 25 minutes. It was really stressful. So, overall, E3 2017 was pretty disappointing. There simply wasn't a ton of new stuff announced this year to really get me excited, it was mainly just showing off stuff we already knew was coming. Don't get me wrong, a lot of premium high quality games were shown off, but they were the same games shown off last year, or even the year before that, and in some cases, the year before that. Not every E3 is a winner, and this one wasn't bad, but pretty underwhelming. So overall, I give E3 2017 a- Excuse me, that must be my doctor, my results must be in. Yellow. Hey Scott, it's Dr. E. Bill here. Got your test results in, and it seems you've been diagnosed with disappointment. Oh. Hey all, Scott here, and welcome to the first ever E3 2018 Productions press conference. I've noticed a lot of excitement surrounding E3 2018 as of late, so why not try to profit off of that kind of excitement? Yes, that means E3 2018 product, conventions for fans of the convention. We have it all. I'm the only person employed by the company as of right now, so just be aware, I'm in this for the long haul. As you can see, the excitement for E3 2018 was through the roof for the week of June 9th, 2018. And just to show you how good that is for a company, here are some happy people. Some happy, happy, happy people. To answer those who ask why I left my self-employed company, uh, creative differences. Totally. Doesn't happen every day. Innovation. Oh man, E3 2018 finally decided to stop by, sporting a brand new logo as well, would you look at that? The old logo was screeching, I'm a 3D graphic from the year 2000 anyway, so a change was overdue. I didn't know what I was truly expecting from this E3. Microsoft and Sony both are a few good years away from new video game console announcements, so it felt like there was definitely room for some new game announcements, and with Nintendo, it's the Switch's second year on the market. I was expecting a few new games, plus Smash Bros. Galore. Not only were there E3 showcases from the big Big 3, but EA, Bethesda, Square Enix, and Ubisoft threw their hat in the ring. That's a lot of ease to 3. Regardless, just like last year, let's take a look at all the main showcases and rank them on a scale of 1 to 5 knee slaps. And before you say anything, yes, I know, Devolver Digital and Limited Run Games had E3 press conferences with some thick honking quotation marks on press conferences, but I have enough stuff to go over. Let's just talk the main ones. Ho ho ho, first up, EA, holding their press conference on Saturday, June 9th. Starting things off with an intro that- oh, oh my god, this is incredible! Hi yeah, I'd like to buy four EAs, please! 
Battlefield 5 is up first, and DICE says it's their take on World War II. Thank God somebody finally is giving their take on that Call of Duty game released last year. Apparently there won't be any loot boxes crammed into Battlefield 5. Yeah, keep telling yourself that. We then get a glimpse at a side story within Battlefield 5 entirely focused on soccer. Shit, this is FIFA. Three presenters on stage talk the Champions League in the game. The presenters on the side are really chatting things up while the one in the middle doesn't say squat. I always love this portion of EA's press conference every year because it reminds me what year it is. Some Star Wars talk as a Star Wars Battlefront 2 developer comes up and chats about the problems and controversies the game has been through and how the team has fixed them up, which equated to a big fat... <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh man, Unravel 2 gets announced. That was the coolest thing in this whole press conference to me personally. I never played the original Unravel, but it felt super not ea so I was really happy to see a sequel focused on co-op get the green light. And it also came out that exact day. That's pretty cool, albeit a little worrying to me just because it probably got completely buried by the rest of E3 news. EA then announces a new EA original, Sea of Solitude. Well, I barely understood a lick of the game, but I can at least respect the developer's passion for the project. NBA Live 19, Matanoid's Bastard Child, and then we get this demo for a mobile strategy game that lasts four score and seven years. I defied virginity, conceived, and had a child during this demo, like, oh my god. It's then revealed to be a mobile command and conquer game, and this, my friends, is where I gave the most I don't give a piss okay. I've ever given. And finally, the last 20 minutes is an interview with Bioware devs on their upcoming game, Anthem. Eh, I don't really care. I'm sure it's gonna be fine, albeit stuff to the brim with stuff people will boycott, but this kind of game just doesn't really appeal to me. And that was EA at E3 2018, a hearty dose of who the hell cares. People were considering this conference to be the worst of all time or something, and to that I say... Really? I mean, what did you expect out of an EA press conference? They already don't really make games the general audience who watches E3 press conferences care about. I don't think there was anything offensive in this thing. It was just mostly predictable and uninteresting. EA's press conference is always one I feel like the most people care the least about, like it's exactly what everybody expected. FIFA, Madden, Star Wars, Battlefield, an EA original, and then Anthem. In my opinion, even if you're a fan of any of these properties, was there really anything to get excited about? Like if you're a diehard fan of Battlefield, was the trailer they showed really that interesting or exciting? I don't think so. They didn't do or show off anything terrible, it's just that EA remains the most uninteresting press conference of the bunch. Microsoft, the first big conference of the bunch, started things off on Sunday, June 10th. The main thing I was looking for during this event was an increasing amount of Xbox One exclusives. Microsoft's main problem is that they just aren't giving any good reason to do whatever the hell this is. Did they succeed? Well, let's go over everything they announced. Halo Infinite. You know, at the start of this trailer, I had a feeling it was Halo. Microsoft loves to do these fake outs with Halo trailers where it doesn't really look like Halo, but oops, they just announced Halo. That's cool, didn't show off anything of the game, but hey, still a good reveal. Phil Spencer comes out on stage and Phil Spencer's all over the crowd and moves right into Ori and the Will of the Wisps, which looks great. It makes me happy seeing Microsoft get behind games that aren't. A new IP by From Software, Sekiro Shadows Die Twice, which looks pretty wicked. I dig the historic Japanese setting. Fallout 76 is up next. They don't really reveal anything at all, just another trailer that looks like Fallout. Thank God it's a regular old Fallout game. A spin off of Life is Strange, the awesome adventures of Captain Spirit. I mean, it looks fine. Well, it's a buy none, get one free, I'll take it. Crackdown 3, again, releasing in 2019. Hey, remember when this game was supposed to come out in 2017? Hey, remember when this game was supposed to come out in 2016? Hey, remember when this game was announced in 2014? Nier Automata is coming to Xbox One. At first I totally forgot this came out only on PS4 and PC originally and thought Microsoft was just showing a trailer for the Game of the Year edition or something. And I was all like, why is this at E3? And then I remembered, that's why that's at E3. We get another look at Metro Exodus and a Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer showing off a frozen world and audio editing that made me think my non-existent hearing aids needed new batteries. Look out! But it's cool to see Microsoft showcase a game like Kingdom Hearts. An update to Sea of Thieves, more Battlefield 5 if you needed more of June 9th in your life. Forza Horizon 4 is an... Uh, God, why do they always have an extended onstage section for Forza? It's Forza. It comes out every single year, we know exactly what it... Never mind, they have confetti coming down to signify fall. I'll buy another Xbox One just for that, but not a third one. You guys really have to impress me for that. Phil Spencer announces that Microsoft acquired five new gaming studios like Ninja Theory and Compulsion Games. 
I mean, I guess that's good that these studios are now owned by a company that can fund world peace, but it could also be detrimental to their freedom. However, the Xbox division now seems to be pretty accommodating to creators, and it seems these companies will still be able to do whatever they want. Also, they announced they bought Undead Labs, who makes the State of Decay games, and Playground Games, who make Forza Horizon, and that was interesting to me simply because I didn't know these studios weren't already owned by Microsoft. We Happy Few gets a trailer, and it of course still reminds me of Bioshock Infinite, may pick this one up sometime. An update to PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds, also known as Scott's Big Bathroom Break. Tales of Vesperia Definitive Edition, including content and characters, aw oh, hell yeah! The Division 2 is up next with a gameplay demo that just hit me right in the shit giving glands, those bad boys refuse to give a shit about this segment. Xbox Game Pass gets some time to shine, an indie game reel, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and oh, oh my god, it's the MMORPG Black Desert! I didn't give a piss last year and I've waited a whole year not to give a piss again! A game called Session was announced, which also goes by, oh, this isn't Skate 4, please leave. Devil May Cry 5, oh, oh wow, well, that looks pretty slick. I was pretty happy at this reveal. Seems to be going back to some classic DMC, not this DMC, more of this DMC. DLC for Cuphead, awesome, next year, Jesus Christ! It's DLC, how can it take that long, come on. This game tunic looks really cool. That tiny fox in a big world is a prime example of the reach of gaming today. Gaming has come so far. Jump Force, combining all your favorite anime heroes like Grumpy, Sleepy, and Doc. I like to play a game called Guess Which Two Words End Up Being the Title. Uh, oh, oh wait, it's Dying Light 2? I, I completely forgot about the original Dying Light, wow. Paddle Toads, oh my god. Nothing to show, but this was out of left field. Really cool, not the rare franchise I think many wanted revived, but still, that's pretty awesome. Just Cause 4, and then a ton of face spinning to fans of Gears of War before they finally decide to whip out their napkins to clean it up with Gears of War 5 revealed. And finally, the long-awaited Cyberpunk 2077 from CD Projekt Red. A bit weird that Microsoft would end their show on a multi-platform title, but still, the world this game is set in looks pretty rad. And that was Microsoft at E3 2018. Honestly, they did really well. Only a few little issues I had with it overall. I felt a few on-stage sections slash gameplay demos they had dragged on too long, but they showed a huge variety of games and it didn't get super uninteresting. There is a little something for everybody, alongside Phil Spencer confirming that, yeah, new Xbox consoles are being developed. It felt like Microsoft was trying to say, just f***ing do it. Even though most of the good games they showed were multi-platform. They did show a fair amount of exclusives, but they were all just kind of sequels to games the Xbox One already had. Halo, Gears of War, Forza, that kind of stuff. I wanted a bit more variety in terms of exclusives, and plus, I don't know if they totally made the Xbox One more appealing. But all in all, good job, Microsoft. Bethesda, clocking in on the night of Sunday, June 10th, was mainly expected to showcase Fallout 76 and pure disappointment as well since rumors were circulating that Fallout 76 was not a traditional Fallout game and was an online-only take on the franchise. Well, we start things off with a heartfelt introduction to the people who made... We move on to a bit of Rage 2 with a musical performance by Andrew WK and the audience seemed absolutely befuddled. Guys, this is what E3 is all about. This is the right amount of fun wackiness and awkwardness. I love when E3 is like this. It didn't overstay its welcome and was entirely entertaining. Couple that with the fact that Rage 2 actually looks pretty good and we have ourselves a decent start to this already. Then we get locked in the lame dungeon for a bit. Elder Scrolls Legends card game update, Elder Scrolls Online, Doom Eternal, oh my god, what? It's a full sequel to the 2016 Doom, that's amazing, that game is so cool. No footage is shown, but nice knowing a sequel is in development, and get ready to say that a lot this conference. Quake Champions, an update to Prey that basically resets whenever you fail, like a fun endurance mode. Wolfenstein 2 standalone expansions are announced, and then everybody's favorite developer you don't want to run into in a dark alleyway, Todd Howard comes on stage to talk some Fallout 76, and yes, it's a fully online Fallout game. Now I have yet to get into the Fallout series. Honestly, I'm just kind of waiting for a re-release of Fallout 3 on PS4 or Switch or something. And this doesn't really seem like something I'd want to get into the series with. I'd rather play one of the more single-player oriented games. It seems like many Fallout fans themselves aren't super interested in this game, but I'll give it to Todd Howard. He did a really good job presenting this game both in terms of presenting it in a good way while also being incredibly captivating. He then goes over a new Elder Scrolls mobile game they've been developing, Elder Scrolls Blades, which I looked at and said, no thank you, I actually like having a fun with decent battery life. I'm already not super into mobile games, but when I am, they're usually simple simplistic 2D games, not console quality ones, so I'll pass. Then he decides to announce the brand new game Bethesda is working on, Starfield. 
I will say, if there's a definitive way to announce a brand new IP in a way that makes me not care at all, it's how Bethesda announced Starfield. Yeah, I know, it's the first new Bethesda IP in over two decades. That's why people are excited, but they didn't show anything except for space. It's like if Nintendo announced arms like this. Like, what the hell does that mean? Well, if that didn't do anything for you, blam, here's the mere fact that Elder Scrolls 6 is a thing and a conference. And I get it. It's cool to get confirmation that Bethesda is at least in the very early stages of production on a new Elder Scrolls, but it's like Nintendo confirming they're working on a new Mario game. Skyrim sold over 30 million copies. You can't tell me Bethesda looked at that and said, man, we did good. That's a nice place to cap it off at. No, of course there's going to be a new Elder Scrolls. The announcement didn't excite me like others, but I will admit it was nice to get a confirmation. Overall, Bethesda did well. When you look at it all, they did didn't show too awful much, but they did a good job maintaining my attention and made some killer announcements. Square Enix was hosting their first E3 showcase in a while on Monday, June 11th. Their last one was 2015, I believe, and they did have a fair amount of that was a waste of 30 minutes. All right, let me recap. Gameplay demo of Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I love me some Tomb Raider. This looks like Tomb Raider. A Final Fantasy XIV Online Monster Hunter World collaboration. Cute. Another trailer for Awesome Adventures of Captain Spirit. Duly noted, it's a thing. Move on. Dragon Quest XI trailer. Nice. A new IP, Babylon's Fall, did not show anything, I'm sold. Nier Automata is coming to Xbox One, we know. Octopath Traveler is coming in July for the Switch, we know. Just Cause 4, double we know. The Quiet Man, finally, a game based off of my favorite 1952 movie. And finally, the ending to end all endings. The same Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer from the Microsoft conference. I don't know why Square felt the need to have a showcase. It was a pre-recorded live stream, much like a Nintendo Direct, but they really didn't need to do this at all. Yes, they have a lot of games this year, but the majority of the content shown was also at Microsoft's press conference the day before. The stuff that was exclusive to this showcase, like the Dragon Quest XI trailer and the cinematic reveal trailers for Babylon's Fall and The Quiet Man, could have been shown off at Sony's event. Not saying anything they showed off was bad, but the showcase didn't show off anything of note, didn't need to be here at all, and just wasted everybody's time. Ubisoft held their conference on Monday, June 11th and started things off with, wow, I didn't expect the rapture to be this colorful. Beyond Good and Evil 2 gets a new trailer. It's nice to see it's still making appearances and didn't disappear into obscurity like it originally did. I still find it off-putting that the characters are f***ing swearing though. They announced that the game will be allowing fans to submit their own artwork and music to be used in the game, and I think that's actually way past neat. Some Rainbow Six talk, Trials Rising promoting alcoholism, a new trailer for The Division 2, which just gave me a hearty dose of this depressive Scott syndrome, like, my god, this thing was Bleak. A look at the Donkey Kong DLC in Mario Plus Rabbits featuring Grant Kirkhope conducting some live music, that was nice. A very long look at Skull and Bones, a trailer for the game Transference, the Toys to Life game Starling featuring Honk and Star Fox, oh my god, he looks incredible! Have Ubisoft make a Star Fox game, jeez! <laughs> it feels like Ubisoft will take any opportunity to flaunt Miyamoto on stage. Some For Honor and the Crew 2 talk, and finally a look at Assassin's Creed Odyssey. You see, Assassin's Creed games have been looking pretty good at E3 recently. But it still isn't enough to get me super into the idea of, you know, playing them. Ubisoft was a bit on the boring side of things this year, not much new, primarily just new looks at games we already knew about. Again, nothing looked bad, but nothing was really all too interesting. Sony held their E3 showcase on the night of Monday, June 11th, and man, I didn't know what I expected, but it wasn't Tentgate 2018. Sean Layden comes waddling up and says, go home. Four games will be getting extended looks at, basically saying, yeah, we've got nothing this year. Except for... Never mind, they literally have nothing. First off, we get an extended look at The Last of Us Part 2 gameplay. I enjoyed The Last of Us, I thought it was a great game, but Last of Us Part 2, while it's gonna be great as well, I thought the gameplay looked really good, it still looks like The Last of Us. It looks impressive, but honestly, it didn't show off anything that new. It just felt like more of The Last of Us to me. Impressive and depressing, exactly what I expected. Got me interested, but it really didn't excite me all too much. And then after that ended, uh, what, what's going on? Yeah, as they change venues, we have banter between these hosts for a good 15 minutes or so, and with this, Sony announces Hell on Earth, and unlike any other game they announced, this actually has a release date of right now. Complete. Pace breaker. Not only does this drag on and leave a sour taste in my mouth for the rest of the show, but they have nothing to announce during this little tangent. They have little Black Ops and Destiny adverts, a recap of games they announced before E3 that they totally could have announced during this lull. And then we finally make our way to the next location where I'm happy my parents didn't walk in on me watching this. And this is where the rest of the conference is held. 
I thought for the four games Sony was highlighting, they would be broadcast from four separate venues, but no, they just felt like showing the Last of Us 2 trailer in a tent and then the rest of the show via an actual theater. It was just bizarre. Like, I'm happy they went back to the theater setup, but that made the tent section feel even more out of place. Anyways, Ghost of Tsushima is the next gameplay demo. Gameplay looks good and graphics look even gooder. Like, look at those leaves! It's developed by Sucker Punch and I absolutely adored Infamous Second Son, so definitely keeping an eye on this one. A trailer for a new game, Control, is shown, which looks interesting. Next is, oh, oh my god, it's the Resident Evil 2 remake! This thing has been said to be in development for so long and we're finally seeing it, that's awesome! Trevor Saves the Universe is shown off and after that, a new Kingdom Hearts 3 trailer also revealing a Kingdom Hearts PS4 Pro and Complete Collection. And now, finally, we get a look at Death Stranding, a game we've known about for years now, but have yet to see gameplay. We can finally see what it plays like! Oh, you got me there. Man, I wish I was a fetus. I know, Hideo Kojima is behind this, we know it'll be quality, but nothing about this looks fun or interesting, I'm sorry. Neo 2 is announced, that's really cool, I still need to get into the first one, but cool nonetheless. And finally, we end things off with a gameplay demo for Spider-Man, exactly how things ended off at E3 2017. Sony's been on an artsy-fartsy kick with their games lately, really hitting home that they create rich worlds and everlasting stories, and they have every right to do so. Video games are art, it's as simple as that. But they just took that mindset too far at E3 2018. No, you don't need to be in a tent to experience The Last of Us Part 2 trailer that has a small section of it take place in a tent. No, you don't need two instances of five straight minutes of one person playing music and nothing else. Sony's problem is that they showed off so many games a few years back with no release dates, and a lot of those games they showed off still aren't out. That means, yeah, a few years ago they dominated E3, but now they have nothing new to show. If the entire show was like the last 30 minutes, that would have been fine, albeit still a bit underwhelming, but no, the first 30 minutes wasted everybody's time. It was so unorganized and Sony was just so unprepared, I was embarrassed for them. And finally, Nintendo. Live streaming a pre-recorded Nintendo Direct on Tuesday, June 12th. Many people will say Nintendo killed it last year with the Nintendo Spotlight at E3 2017. I liked it, but had a few problems with it. The length was just too short, being around 20 minutes. Plus, they didn't show off a ton a ton, but still enough to leave me feeling relatively satisfied. With this being slated as a standard Nintendo Direct, and with this also being the second year of the Nintendo Switch, I felt it was reasonable to expect a bit more than last year. I mean, hey, the console's been out for a while, and the presentation was gonna be longer. Before we get into what I thought of Nintendo's E3 showcase, excuse me, I have to wipe some shit off of my shoe. Ah, oh, man, that explains a lot. We start things off with a giant mech game. Honestly, at first I thought it was a reboot of Custom Robo or a Gundam game or Zone of the Enders or something, but nope, it's a game called Damon X Machina. Huh. I mean, it looks pretty cool, but to start the show off with such an obscure third-party Japanese mech game seemed weird. Like, this feels like it would have fit better in the middle of a barrage of games, not something to start the show off with. Again, not saying it looked bad, but just an odd thing to show first with no context. Speaking of games that aren't something to start the show off with, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 DLC. I've made it embarrassingly clear that I'm not a Xenoblade guy, so not only was I not really interested in this, but I thought this was another weird one to highlight at the beginning and at E3 of all things. This feels more prime for your everyday Nintendo Direct. Then we have this whole spiel of Reggie talking to us going on about Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, which was announced about two weeks ago, and they don't really reveal anything new. Just Mew being obtainable with the Pokeball Plus accessory. I've never been a big Pokemon guy, but if I was gonna play any new Pokemon game, it would probably be this. It looks nice and relatively easy for somebody like me to sink his Pokemon virgin teeth into. But this is the kind of stuff I hate seeing companies do during E3. Waste time going over things they announced before E3 and revealing nothing new. Like... Ugh. We then go into the big new E3 game announcements from Nintendo, starting with Super Mario Party. Apparently, it's supposed to be a return to the traditional Mario Party formula with some new ideas thrown in there. You see, Mario Party has been drowning in piss poor ideas and gimmicks the past few years, so I think this may be a great return. I say I think because this trailer focused on the people playing Super Mario Party rather than the game. I swear, like 90% of this trailer was worthless footage of people sitting on a couch or out and about playing Mario Party, but they weren't showing Mario Party! I mean, the game looks promising, and after looking at an extended game, gameplay demo, it is in fact very promising. But the trailer made me feel cautious. Mario Party's had a rocky track record, couple that with how the trailer barely showed the game, and I was skeptical. Next up is Fire Emblem Three Houses. What a title. Again, this is another franchise I'm not really into at all, but for what it is, it looked pretty good. I thought the transition between the top-down grid to on-the-field third-person was really smooth. 
Then again, that might be done just for the trailer. The title weirds me out though, like it doesn't really fit in with Fire Emblem's more refined title formats lately. Like we had Awakening, Fates, Echoes, Heroes, Three Houses! Fortnite is coming to the Switch. Good for Nintendo, but is this really an amazing feat? Fortnite runs on freaky smartphones. I'm expected to piss a dick over the fact that it's on my Nintendo Switch. Yeah, Fortnite for Switch was leaked and rumored loads before this announcement, but I find Rocket League's announcement for Switch last year far more compelling. I mean, that game was only on PS4, Xbox One, and PC. It was way cooler to learn it was coming to the system compared to Fortnite, in my opinion. Nice to have it on the Switch, but far from impressive. Reggie then talks some indie games coming like Overcooked 2, Killer Queen Black, and Hollow Knight, which all look to be quality titles. I've heard nothing but good things about Killer Queen, so I'm definitely gonna want to try it out sometime. Then a montage of games coming to the Switch, slash already on the system, soft revealing Dragon Ball Fighters, lots of quality titles, Ninjala looks kinda cool, and that's about it. This montage barely revealed anything new. And that was the Nintendo Direct for E3 2018, minus one section of the Direct, which was the size of a Super Smash Bros. Ultimate reveal section of your everyday average E3 2018 Nintendo Direct, which, don't worry, we'll talk about that in a ripe sec, but my god, that was the definition of disappointment. Tons of people constantly say how you should keep your expectations in check and should be grateful for Nintendo announcing anything at all. I mean, I think it's pretty fair to expect a similar amount of announcements as we've gotten in previous years. I wasn't asking for the world here, I just wanted more than this. If you say, oh, they didn't show off much else because Smash Brothers would overshadow it. Oh, so it's fine for Smash Brothers to overshadow Mario Party and Fire Emblem then? Look back at E3 2014. Not only did they have Smash Brothers, but Yoshi's Woolly World, Kirby and the Rainbow Curse, Captain Toad, Mario Maker, Zelda Wii U. Plus new looks at Bayonetta 2, Xenoblade X, Hyrule Warriors. I wanted that again this year and instead Nintendo barely showed off anything, both in terms of new games or new details on upcoming games we know about. We didn't see Metroid Prime 4, Bayonetta 3, Yoshi for Switch, nothing. At least Sony made it clear during their showcase that they weren't showing much. All Nintendo said was, we're focusing on games coming out in 2018 and Super Smash Bros. Which is a statement that I think at least implied we were gonna see more than what we got. The games shown weren't bad at all. The Direct itself? Yeah, that blew. There were less games unveiled here than in the Nintendo Direct Mini in January of this year. A mini direct had more games, think about that. If you weren't a Smash Brothers fan, this was easily a pretty bad E3 for Nintendo. Pull away right there, because I am a Smash Brothers fan. Holy shit, this is so honking cool. It's only a matter of time until CJ from San Andreas joins the battle. Every single Smash Brothers character ever, all here and from what it seems the vast majority, if not all stages as well, this is insane. It's great to see a lot of these characters back. I was so giddy watching them unveil the roster for this game. Not only were we seeing the game for the first time, but getting character confirmation after character confirmation. Part of me is sad that we won't have those months upon months of speculation on who made the cut, but getting this video was a solid replacement. It made me feel. Graphically, the game looks very Super Smash Bros. for Wii U E with different lighting. The game looks much better than the Wii U one in many instances, but some make it look a bit worse in my opinion. Like, the colors seem too undersaturated. Why is Pikachu this pale? He should be mustard yellow, damn it! But the game overall looks very nice, especially the stages. One of my biggest complaints with Smash Wii U was the lack of attention to bring in old stages back. It felt like they just threw them in there without caring. Now with Smash Ultimate, most are fully remastered from the ground up and look like modern stages. They all look great. A new clone character or Echo Fighter as they refer to them now, was revealed to be Daisy and Nintendo stock dropped 12 times in size that day. Inkling looks great as a newcomer and they added Ridley! I would have preferred his older design like the one they used in Smash Brothers Brawl. Regardless, it's really cool to have him here finally. I was always rooting for his inclusion. I always thought he could totally work. They go over some new advanced techniques, which is great to see and a release date was given being December 7th and that was it for Smash Brothers Ultimate info unveiled during the Direct. Smash Brothers is all about bringing together so many things from different games, so this is the Smash Brothers of Smash Brothers, taking everything from previous games and putting them into this one. I was very happy after the reveal of this. However, I'm not beyond excited for this one like I was for Smash for 3DS and Wii U when they were announced. I don't know, with those being unveiled, they were entirely new things and there was more to speculate on. While there is a lot new in Ultimate, it's obviously heavily based on Smash Brothers for Wii U. Couple that with the fact that it hasn't been that long since Smash Brothers Wii U, and it makes the reveal of this not as impactful to me personally. And that took 30 minutes of the Nintendo Direct to go over Smash. The entire Direct was 45 minutes. If you aren't a fan of Smash Brothers, I'm sorry. Like, I love hearing Sakurai go over how they added the chest from Breath of the Wild to Kirby's Down B, but 
I don't know if the general public who watches E3 gives half a darn. I feel like a lot of this info would have been better suited for a Smash Brothers exclusive direct. It pains me to give Nintendo such a low score for this E3 with them bringing a Smash Brothers game that made me as happy as it did, but they just didn't show anything, man. I'm really getting tired of Nintendo focusing on one game each E3 now. It doesn't do anything but make E3 less exciting. I know Nintendo spreads information about their games all across the year now, but that doesn't mean they couldn't have shown more during their E3 Direct. Just a few new gameplay trailers, one or two new game announcements. Even games that are a bit smaller, just something else to discuss, something else to look forward to. But they didn't do that, so... And I'm really conflicted on this E3. I was fairly disappointed with E3 2017. I just felt like all the companies didn't bring enough new content to the table. I think this E3 definitely was better in that regard, but man, the highs were so high and the lows were so low. Like Super Smash Bros. Ultimate, looked absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But was it really worth it when we only saw two other games from Nintendo, one being Fire Emblem and the other being Mario Party? Like, I'm sorry, but those two games aren't these super huge things. It just didn't cut it for me. Sony showed off some excellent games, but at the same time barely, and I mean barely, showed off anything new of their own, while also having one of the sloppiest and most annoying E3 presentations in recent memory. Overall, I'd say this E3 was alright, albeit with a good chunk of disappointments lodged in there. E3 2018 has come and gone. Just like bills do, of which I have a few left pertaining to E3 2018 productions. Shit, I'm not getting the security deposit back on that company building. Should have just done that press conference in a tent. Hey all, Scott here. I don't know why it's taking me this long to start committing witchcraft, but here we are. I'm gonna try and look into the future and find out what all the E3 press conferences are gonna be like. Well, that ruined the surprise. I can smell virginity and Todd Howard swearing in the air, so it must mean E3 2019's here, my favorite E3 of 2019. Going into it, this was an interesting show based on how uninteresting it seemingly was. No press conferences from Sony and EA. Now, it wouldn't be E3 without EA boring people, so they did have a presence in the form of their own event a couple of days before E3 as usual, but Sony was completely absent. So that left Microsoft, Nintendo, and Google f***ing Stadia to pick up the slack. This is a bad sign. As per usual, I'll be taking a look at each of the major showcases from this E3 and rating them on a scale of 1 to 5 knee slaps, starting things off with Google's Stadia Connect on June 6th. Yeah, this really wasn't a part of E3, but we didn't have Sony showing us Spider-Man during the press conference for the fourth time this year, so might as well talk about this. So Google Stadia is the hip new thing to not care about, a streaming platform for games that's been the dream for almost a decade now for a lot of companies. Being able to connect to the internet and play top of the line games stream to your device. You don't need any big fancy hardware. They use the big fancy hardware themselves and stream the experience to you. It's something from what I've experienced, works fine, but not fine enough to fully replace standard consoles. But if there's anybody who can make game streaming popular and work well, it's probably Google. So let's see what they have in store for us. Anybody ever wonder what the side of Phil Harrison looks like? Thank you! Phil Harrison stands in purgatory while letting us know Stadia Connect is going to be their platform to deliver all the news about Google Stadia. Yes, they're ripping off State of Play. So yeah, we can play games with no console required. All we need is a Chromecast, laptop, tablet, or phone, and internet connection. The first wave of games available via Google Stadia is about to be unveiled, but first it's Baldur's Gate 3, everybody! Think about the game series I have the least affinity for. Baldur's Gate is right after it, I know nothing about this series, but I do know this game has been a long time coming and it's great to see it finally come to fruition, weird foot stuff and all. We can't wait for you to play Baldur's Gate 3 on Stadia. No, on PC you can f*** right off. Alright, so we get some internet speed requirements for Stadia. Now, honestly, not that bad. Of course, the quality gets worse the slower your internet speeds are, but as long as it runs smoothly and only the resolution takes a slight hit, that's okay. This guy talks about the sheer speed of Google Stadia like it's faster than a car or something. That's perfect for fighting games like Mortal Kombat. Finally, I can play Mortal Kombat 11 with Google Chrome. That was why I didn't buy the game originally. All right, so what do I need to use Google Stadia? Well, no integrity for one. The main thing you'll need is a controller. The Stadia controller is shown off here and honestly looks like a fairly standard controller. It looks comfortable enough. But you can use a bunch of different types of controllers instead if you want to. Xbox One, PS4, or even just keyboard and mouse. All right, we're finally ready to play Stadia. The only other thing you need is a screen to play on. If you'd rather play on your laptop, desktop, or tablet. Why was the desktop smaller than the laptop? So the dream for Google is to have Stadia run on anything with Chrome installed on it. What a bold dream. And now we finally get some game showcased. Oh, 
Yeah, it's a game platform. Ghost Recon Breakpoint. I'm sorry, but most of the Tom Clancy game trailers just kind of blend together for me. So watching this trailer was the longest I ever held this expression. Guilds a horror game made by the guys who made Rhyme. It looks sort of interesting. I like the character design. It reminds me of Psychonauts, but also these sort of horror themes games like Limbo or Inside give off, where yeah, it can be gruesome, but hey, cartoony character designs and art. Apparently this is just a Google Stadia game at the moment, so we'll give one point to Stadia for one exclusive. Things might start to heat up here. Get packed. This is a multiplayer game like Overcooked, but you're moving things. They're not joking around. Tom Clancy's The Division 2. Yes, more Tom Clancy, just what Stadia needs. I don't really understand why they're talking about The Division 2 as if it's not out yet. It came out in March. They're saying stuff like, oh, we learned so much from the first game when designing Division 2 and talking about the setting of the game. And it's like, that's the stuff you say before the game comes out. We know all of this. Just show that Division 2 is coming to Stadia and move on. That's a look at just some of the amazing titles we're bringing to you at launch. What? If those are the main top of the line cream of the crop games they're showing off for Stadia, we're in trouble. So on to how much it'll cost. There's an optional subscription model, Stadia Pro. 10 bucks a month for the best streaming quality, you get select games for free and discounts on some titles. Kind of like the Stadia version of PlayStation Plus or something, but you can just use Stadia in 2020 for free. You can just buy the games you want and play them with your internet connection, no extra subscription fee or anything. The Stadia Founders Edition is some collector's first release version of Stadia. You get a Chromecast, a controller, and three months of Stadia Pro. You can also pick up an additional Stadia controller for $69. Why the hell are controllers so expensive now? Oh, it's all worth it. I get Destiny 2 for free with Stadia Pro. Destiny 2, a $7 value for free. Yeah, you get all the expansions with it on Stadia, but I don't care. I just like bringing up the fact that Destiny 2 is seven bucks now. Once again, they go through a long video about Destiny 2, a game that's been out for two years. This isn't selling me on Stadia. There's the reveal of the expansion Shadow Keep. All right, okay, cool, great. So the Stadia Founders Edition is $129 with all this. Honestly, not a terrible price. We're at the end now and get a big montage of all the other games coming to Stadia. Whoa, 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 whoa! It's thank you for flashing all those logos by. I have no idea what's coming to Stadia that was so fast. So a good chunk of games are coming and a lot of them are good stuff. Doom, the Tomb Raider games, Borderlands 3. But a lot of these are things already available on other platforms. It gives me flashbacks of the problem with third party support on the Wii U. Oh yeah, the Switch primarily has old games and it's succeeding hard, but you can play them all portably. That's a big plus for a lot of people. It's a good reason to buy these old games. With the Wii U, you could play Mass Effect 3 on it like six months after everybody else. That wasn't really an exciting game to play at the time. Now, you could play it off the TV on the Wii U gamepad, which was nice, but you were required to be nearby the Wii U console. Kind of like how Stadia requires you to have an internet connection. So I'm fine with Google Stadia. I don't know if it's going to be a huge hit or anything. I think it'll work well, but none of the games shown are compelling to buy on Stadia for me. I own all the consoles these things will appear on or are already on. I mean, it's kind of cool that since this is all streaming based, you really never have to buy a new video game console. But was buying a new video game console every seven years really a huge issue? You'd be spending 120 bucks a year to use Stadia Pro anyway, so the positives of Stadia compared to standard consoles aren't really speaking to me. The idea of picking up a game I was playing on my laptop right where I left off on my phone is novel as well, but I just don't see myself doing it very often. Streaming a game from my phone on LTE will fry my battery life and eat up so much data, it's ridiculous. Plus what, I have to bring a controller as well to connect my phone to? That's not fun. Also, the game lineup is just not powerful enough, man. Not enough exclusives, and at that, good exclusives. I know there are numerous people very against the idea of console exclusives, but exclusives drive people to other platforms. Exclusive promote competition. Competition means companies work to make their products better and more appealing, which means we get better products. And it's coming down to the fact that PlayStation has God of War, Stadia has Get Packed. This presentation didn't sell me on Stadia. It wasn't that bad, but well, wasn't exciting at all. Well, on to EA. Now, I had absolutely no expectations going into the Stadia event, so I refused to make predictions for it. But now we're finally into the real deal, the mainstay E3 presentations. So my predictions for EA Play 2019 is that I won't watch it. EA hosted their their thing on June 8th. It wasn't a part of E3, as per usual with EA. Now, they like to do their own thing during E3 called EA Play even though they hold it every year the day before Microsoft's E3 press conference and everybody just lumps it in with E3, so why not just participate in E3? But you know, EA's better than that. They can totally do their own stupid f***ing thing. Either way, EA didn't hold a traditional show this year and said they opted to hold a three hour long live stream talking about like six games. They started talking about Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order and it definitely looks like such a Star Wars game. Moved on to Apex Legends, a free to play game that's already out. Good to focus on that for half an hour. Battlefield 5, FIFA 20, Madden 20, and ending off with The Sims 4. I can't believe I'm saying 
saying this, I miss EA's 2018 show. At least with that, that was just an hour of stuff I didn't care about. Now I'm terrified of any video online with these three terms in the title. Three hours on these games. That's ridiculous. They should have at least put out a 20 minute video showing off gameplay or the trailers of the main things they were showcasing at EA Play this year, and then proceed to do this whole talk show thing for three hours. But no, the talk show thing was the entire show. That's stupid. Now I would love to spill the beans on my detailed thoughts on the whole three hour long live stream, but never in my life did I love not watching EA Play 2019 than during EA Play 2019. All I did was skim this thing and boom, we have an opinion. Three hours of interviews and BSing about six games in total, none of which are new titles we didn't know about. I shouldn't even rate this because EA wasn't acting like this was a for realsies press conference, and they were pretty upfront with letting us know this was exactly what we were getting. But that doesn't mean this was good, this was their E3 show this year, and judging it as an E3 show, they didn't show off anything of note except for Star Wars, they didn't show off anything new, and it was three hours long. This is gonna feel good. Microsoft is up next, and I predict that Phil Spencer doesn't exist. June 9th was the Xbox show, and this was a big one. With Sony not showing up, all eyes were on Microsoft. Everybody assumed, oh, since Sony's not there, all the third-party games will be shown off at Microsoft's conference. Plus, Microsoft and Nintendo were becoming way more buddy-buddy than usual with stuff like Cuphead coming to Switch. But people were speculating that maybe Nintendo would have some presence at the Xbox show. Maybe a Smash Brothers reveal for Blinks, who knows? Maybe Microsoft will come out on stage showing their brand new next-generation console. And all of these assumptions and more, are f***ing stupid. Here's Lego Forza. This is the Xbox E3 2019 briefing. I hope this announcer gets work outside of Microsoft's E3 every year. First game shown off is The Outer Worlds, that game by Obsidian revealed at the last Game Awards. A little weird this starts the show off. I mean, yeah, Obsidian became a Microsoft-owned studio late last year, but this game is still coming to PS4, so it's not like this big Xbox exclusive. Looks pretty good, though. It's like Obsidian said, well, fine, we'll make our own Fallout running away from Bethesda. Next up is Bleeding Edge by Ninja Theory. This one's really funky to me. Like, okay, Ninja Theory's a very talented studio, but they didn't really find their own voice until 2017 with Hellblade, and that was a heavily narrative-driven single-player experience, so their next game is a 4v4 multiplayer game. Not saying they can't do a game like this, but it's just weird that after Hellblade did so well, they do anything but Hellblade next. Ori and the Will of the Wisps, look at this game. I like this. I love how everything I've seen of Ori mixes together great looking gameplay with such amazing atmospheric storytelling. The animation is incredible here, and the first Ori game is something I really need to get to soon. The sequel is coming out in early 2020, almost three years after its announcement. Oh my god! Ooh, a brand new game from the creators of Minecraft! <laughs> Mafia 4! Minecraft Dungeons! Okay, it's a Minecraft dungeon crawler. It fits the IP well. It looks fine. Ha! <laughs> My patent just came in! It looks like I'm the official owner of the phrase, it looks fine now. It's a great phrase to use to describe games I don't care about, but don't want to piss anybody off with my opinion on them. We'll be hearing that a lot this show. Please welcome the head of Xbox. Phil Spencer. Damn it! Aw, oh, this guy. Phil Spencer's cool. I like him, but Jesus, there's this guy in the audience who tries to start a round of applause for everything he says. To be a significant unifying force for the world. Could you imagine if all E3 audiences were like this, just screaming at every little thing a presenter has to say no matter how unimpactful it is? Yeah, that would be ridiculous. Phil Spencer says, get this, we're gonna talk about 60 games. 50 of which will be shown in an indie game highlight reel. We'll be talking about our cloud gaming project and our new console. Here's EA Star Wars. A Jedi Fallen Order trailer, well, the old saying still remains true. You don't need a three hour long live stream to show people a new Star Wars game. It looks pretty good, but this pesky little thing won't come off. Blair Witch, that was unexpected. I love those trailers where you don't fully know what the game is until a good while into the trailer. And this one was one of those that made me go, Oh. Cyberpunk 2077 looks great. Now, to be fair, most of what we saw was just a cutscene. We've known about the first person perspective of the game for a while now, but it still catches me off guard. I don't know, I just feel like third person would suit this game more. Either way, it still looks really good. And it also looks really Keanu Reeves. Keanu Reeves cannibalized the memory anybody had of seeing the Blair Witch trailer. He overtook all conversations surrounding the Xbox presentation and he barely did anything. Still, it was really cool to see him, but my god, was that pretty much the only takeaway anybody had regarding this conference. Bleeding Edge, what the hell is that? Did you see Keanu? All right, next game. First thought, I was like, damn, they're making a game about Sagwa the Chinese cat, and then it turned out to be something I didn't know how to pronounce. Spirit Far, Fair, I don't know, it looks pretty. 
Battletoads, hell yes, I was interested in seeing what came of this game. It was announced last year, but we finally got gameplay and this is Battletoads all right. I'm a little mixed on the graphics. I do think they look exactly how they showed it. it. Makes this feel like a Saturday morning cartoon and that's great, but the animation is a bit choppy. I wish it was a bit more fluid or had more spectacle to it all. I do like the new turbo tunnel. The fact that it's from a new perspective is a fun twist. It's nothing groundbreaking, but I think it's exactly what a modern Battletoad should be. RPG Time The Legend of Riot. This is probably a bitch to play and to understand where you are and what's going on, but it looks really cool. I like the art style a lot. ID at Xbox, showing a metric 50 indie games. I remember absolutely none of these from the conference. Oh sh Killer Queen Black is still not out? Some Xbox Game Pass talk, just some new titles coming and a new version of the program coming to PC. The Game Pass is neat. I got three months for a dollar and I'm loving every minute of barely spending money on DMC. You ever have one of those moments when you watch a trailer and jokingly say, No, <laughs> Microsoft Flight Simulator's coming back. And then, oh sh Age of Empires 2 Definitive Edition. It looks fine. Wasteland 3. It looks fine. Xbox buys double fine. Well, I mean, I can understand that. Anybody ever play Happy Action Theater on the 360 for Kinect? That was a legitimately fun Kinect title published by Microsoft and Double Fine made it. Uh, come to think of it, most of their titles have been on Microsoft platforms and tonally they remind me a lot of Rare. So I think this is a good fit. Hopefully Double Fine doesn't go downhill like Rare did back when Microsoft first bought them. But I think with the current state of Xbox, I trust that they'll let Double Fine do what they want to do most of the time. We get a small trailer for Psychonauts 2, and it's starting to look really good. Like, in the world of crowdfunded games, this is visually fantastic. I'd be shocked if this falls into the camp of mediocrity that a lot of these long-awaited crowdfunded sequels squirm around in. A new LEGO Star Wars following the events of all nine films, that's really cool actually. Uh, Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, uh, it seems that Xbox is really into showing Dragon Ball Z related games each year now, and you know what? I'm just gonna say it. It looks fine. 12 minutes is interesting, so you're stuck in a time loop experiencing the same moment in your life right before somebody comes in and kills you, and I suppose you just do different things each time the world resets to alter the outcome ever so slightly. This is totally gonna be just a two hour long game. I'm interested to see how they shake things up with the same thing repeating over and over, but I think it has potential. It looks pretty cool. Way to the Woods. You remember those E3 games you don't remember? Yeah, that's Way to the Woods for me. I do not remember seeing this game during the presentation at all. Microsoft has so many of those types of games during the press conferences every year. They really go for a huge quantity of games, but a lot of them just don't leave an impression at all. I'm sorry, but a lot of the time with Microsoft's E3 shows, it feels like with the games they show, they'll take whatever trailers they get. Looking at it now, the game actually looks pretty good. I'm just saying, memorability is sort of a problem with a lot of the games at these shows. Gears 5 is confirmed to have faces, and no gameplay apparently, because most of this was just faces. They went under the stage for some reason, and then had some CG trailer for some multiplayer mode. Man, good for them. This game is coming out in September. Why are they barely showing gameplay? Are they just like, yeah, it's Gears of War, they know what it is. We could show gameplay, but let's build an underground lair. A new Xbox Elite controller, that's fun. I heard good things about the level, oh my god. Dying Light 2, yeah, that game's doing the whole existing thing. Now all of this is fine, but I just don't find any of this impressive unless they find a way to put a car on stage. I love video games. Forza Horizon 4 has this pretty cute looking Lego expansion, and the car they brought out on stage was full out Lego. Finally, a reason to play Forza. Gears pop for mobile devices. That came out of my mouth. Like I said, sometimes it feels like Microsoft will take any trailer they can get for E3. Why don't they show this? And even then, why did they not group this together with the Gears 5 trailer? Like, why didn't you play it after that? Also, this was shown last year at E3. Why have they shown the same mobile game at E3 two years in a row? State of Decay 2 expansion. I love State of Decay 1. I haven't played 2 yet, so this trailer doesn't really do much for me. I might give 2 a try sometime though. Fantasy Star Online 2. It looks fine. Wait, that's actually kind of cool. This game has never been localized. I believe it was announced to come to the West years ago, but it never happened. So to see this finally come out over here is amazing. Even if I'm not too interested in playing it, it's still awesome to see fans finally get to play this game in English. Except the Europeans, Sega thinks they hate Fantasy Star. Crossfire X, a PC legend with over 650 million players, comes to Xbox One. Where the hell was I when 650 million people played this? It seems to be more of a thing outside of the US, mainly Asian countries. I guess this is cool, but I mean, I don't know what the hell it is. Tales of Arise, Jesus Christ, that's beautiful. Borderlands 3 and New Borderlands 2 DLC, Elden Ring, a From Software, George R.R. Martin collaboration, and finally, the big topics. Project xCloud and Microsoft's game streaming service. It didn't really go into much detail, but hey, Project Scarlet, the next generation Xbox is fully 
talked about. The main thing with Scarlet is that it's going to have drastically quicker load times and they fully committed to backwards compatibility with the Xbox One. I'm very happy about both of those things. It's just not crazy exciting at the moment. All it really proves is next E3 is probably gonna be way more interesting. They show these graphics between people talking and I was like, oh man, this must be the console, but super up close and then, Oh, well, we officially know what the word Scarlet looks like now. Halo Infinite is revealed to be a cross-generation title coming to Xbox One and Scarlet at launch holiday 2020, and it gets a new trailer. No gameplay, but I really like the trailer. That was good. Nothing mind-blowing, nothing that left much of an impression outside of Keanu Reeves saying a few sentences, but nothing that was bad. I feel like we all kind of thought Microsoft's conference was going to be this huge thing, this monumental moment in gaming, Sony's out of the picture, so it's Xbox's time to shine. Nintendo's going to make an appearance and confirm some Xbox games on Switch or an Xbox character in Smash Brothers. Alright, after all this was said and done, I kind of realized the idea of Nintendo on Microsoft stage didn't make much sense. Like, Nintendo's not really supporting Xbox. Xbox is supporting Nintendo, so if anything, Microsoft would appear in a Nintendo Direct. Anyways, this felt like a very, very typical Xbox conference. The main few things I remembered were Cyberpunk and Halo Infinite, and nothing really left a huge impression outside of those two, and that made it a bit disappointing, though nothing was straight up bad at all. I'd say this was a solid conference by Microsoft, just nothing crazy. For Bethesda's conference, since I know it'll be bad, I predict they'll show nothing new, but some loud f will eat it up. It must be tough being Bethesda, releasing a bad video game and people criticize you for it? God, that must be the worst. June 9th, a couple hours after Microsoft's conference, Bethesda took the stage and started off with the usual a heartfelt video saying how deep down, we're all Bethesda. I feel like Bethesda really wants people to not consider them as big of a publisher as they really are. Like, they do all these things to make it feel like they're doing things for the fans and they're super down to earth, but in reality, they're pretty much another Activision in my eyes. So Todd Howard comes out, makes a quip about Fallout 76 not being good. Elder Scrolls Blades, that mobile game is talked about, and gets announced for Switch. The audience f***ing loses it. Oh my god, a mobile game is coming to Switch. It's every man's dream. I'm sorry, this is such lame Switch support. I'd rather take Fallout 3 or Oblivion or something, not a port of a mobile game. Some updates to Fallout 76, including... Yeah, we put a battle royale in Fallout 76. Oh, he said f He's one of us! And NPCs are getting added to the game. Oh, it's like an actual video game now. Todd Howard comes back out and confirms, hey, we're working on those games we confirmed last year. Shinji Mikami comes out and announces a new game, Ghostwire Tokyo, hands it off to Akumi Nakamura to discuss it a bit. I can confirm, she's adorable. So no gameplay, but color me intrigued, I'm interested to see more. That's it, that's literally all I can say. They show no gameplay, what do you want me to say? Toot the noodles. A video plays of people talking about their Bethesda experiences, this guy comes out and people just go off. People start screaming after everything he says. I'm just sitting here like, man, this guy's just talking about Elder Scrolls Online. Literally, this audience freaks out over anything. Like, Todd Howard could come back on stage. Hey everybody, it's Todd Howard. I'm an arsonist. Yeah! He talks about Elder Scrolls Online or something. Uh, people were cheering. I don't know, at this point I was outside looking for moles. A new Commander Keen is announced. For mobile devices, Jesus Christ. I feel like if this was a $10 downloadable game on PS4, Xbox One, and Switch, it would do fairly well. I think the fact this is a mobile game just confirmed everybody watching this presentation has no interest in it anymore. Choose from a caboodle of contraptions to conquer challenges. And try saying that five times fast. The twins go on adventure. The fact people laughed at that joke confirms the audience was paid to applaud everything. Like, if they made that joke at the Xbox conference seven years ago, nobody would flinch. Elder Scrolls Legends, oh my god, who cares? So you could experience the Elder Scrolls in a new way. Rage 2 update, Wolfenstein Youngblood and Cyberpilot coming soon. Yeah, we know. Wolfenstein Youngblood. Words, words, he said words! A new game by Arcane, Deathloop, okay, no gameplay, cool. Another video, something about game streaming. You don't even know what it is, stop screaming! So it's just a software solution to optimize games for streaming. Okay, cool. You can sign up for the Slayers Club to stream Doom 2016 for free. Everybody could use a little more Doom in their lives. What the hell is wrong with you? It's Doom 2016. If you're screeching about it this much, then you've obviously already played it. So why are you freaking out about being able to play it again for free? Why? Finally, we end things off with Doom Eternal. It looks fantastic. I really enjoyed Doom 2016, and this looks like it's bringing back that same adrenaline rush-infused gameplay. I love it. Our totally new Doom multiplayer experience. We call it Battle Mode. 
You're gonna freak out about Doom 2016, but then you get hesitant applause for multiplayer. Once I think I figure out this crowd, they do this to me. Bethesda at E3 2019. I really hope I never have to use those two things in a sentence ever again. What the hell happened here? Not only was this conference flooded by some guys screaming at almost every sentence the presenter said, interrupting them and making the conference like four hours longer than it was intended to be, but Bethesda didn't really show anything. Like the games they announced were either who the hell cares, no gameplay shown, games we already knew about, games that are there at every E3 for Bethesda, or Doom Eternal, which looks fantastic, but I was already sold on it, so whatever. The audience was acting like they've never seen anything like this before. Garbage. Doom Eternal looks great, but I don't care. It wasn't enough to save this thing for me. I predict Ubisoft will announce something other than a new Tom Clancy game. <laughs> All right, here we go. Let's speed through Ubisoft show because there's gonna be a whole lot of it looks fines from me and it just ain't worth it. June 10th, it all started with an Assassin's Creed Symphony. Nice music, but I wouldn't go to one of their live performances. I couldn't care less about Assassin's Creed music. It's not iconic like Zelda music, for example. That's why something like the Zelda Symphony worked way better in my opinion. But who knows, that could just be the stupid Nintendo fan of me saying that. Watch Dogs Legion. Watch Dogs is pretty decent, and this looks like more Watch Dogs. I do like the idea of being able to control multiple characters. That's pretty cool. A new TV show by the Always Sunny Guys. Why is this at E3? Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Siege. It looks fine. Adventure Time in Brawlhalla. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon Breakpoint. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's Elite Squad. It looks dumb. Just Dance 2020 for the Wii. Not the Wii U, PS3 or 360, but the Wii. I love that. For Honor update. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six Quarantine. It looks fine. Tom Clancy's The Division 2 update. Does anybody know who Tom Clancy is anymore? Jesus Christ, nearly half the games shown here are Tom Clancy games. Jesus, this is brutal. You play Plus, a Ubisoft subscription service. Oh my God. I'm really tired of companies thinking their shit doesn't stink and they can make their own subscription service. Like when companies say, man, we don't need to put our stuff on Netflix. People will pay for our own streaming service. I'm sorry, but who thinks this is a good deal? Nearly all of these games are stupidly cheap now. Why would I pay $15 a month for Rayman Origins and Uno? Who's gonna say, damn, I wanna play Ubisoft games and only Ubisoft games, but I don't wanna own them. I'll pay for a Ubisoft subscription service. I just don't see the point. Roller Champions, all right, a Ubisoft Rocket League. It looks like it could be fun. And Gods and Monsters, a game that legitimately has a very nice art style. But I don't know what the game plays like. Oh my God, that stunk. That wasn't great. I think it was better than Bethesda in terms of just having new games there and being less annoying. But to be honest, the screaming dude at Bethesda at least made a terrible conference sort of funny. I think Ubisoft was slightly better, but barely. No Sony this year, but Square Enix hosted their own press conference around the same time Sony does on June 10th. And I predict everybody will say they loved Square Enix's presentation just because they show the Final Fantasy VII Remake. And oh boy did they! This game looks incredible! I'm actually interested in a Final Fantasy game! And then they proceed to tell us about a game that's already out! Damn it! To be fair, a new episode is on its way for Life is Strange 2. They're not the best way to move forward after such an amazing introduction. Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered. This was announced almost a year ago. When is this coming out? Winter? What the hell? How is this coming out over a year after it got announced? The Last Remnant Remastered, available now on Switch. That would have been a crazy announcement if I knew what The Last Remnant was. Octopath Traveler on PC, okay, cool. A Dragon Quest Builders 2, all right, yeah, you know, it's coming soon. A Dragon Quest 11 on Switch, oh my God, this is a game from 2017. This isn't interesting. This looks very good on Switch, but this is an old game and we already saw all of the improvements in this version in a previous Nintendo Direct. Both 11 and Builders 2's trailer just felt needlessly long to me. I was just like, yeah, I get it. Especially with 11s, considering, you know, people can play Dragon Quest XI right now. Circuit Superstars and Battalion 1944. Okay, these were some of the most forgettable games shown off at E3. I have to give them that. Square Enix music now available to stream. Yeah, that happened before this conference. Nothing new here. Kingdom Hearts 3 DLC, Final Fantasy XIV update, Dying Light 2, Romancing Saga 3, and Scarlet Grace coming to the West. That's pretty cool. Final Fantasy Brave Exvius. Jesus, what the hell is up with companies showing mobile games during their press conference? conferences this year. Outriders, done by People Can Fly. You know, I really enjoyed Bulletstorm, but this game does nothing for me so far. I I just don't really care. Oninaki. It looks fine. Final Fantasy VIII is finally getting a re-release. That's awesome. I think the source code for this game was lost, so it's great to see it actually resurface. And the Avengers game by Crystal Dynamics is finally shown off. This was announced years ago, and hey, they're finally confident in showing Showing some cutscenes. They spliced in like four seconds of gameplay, but that was it. I really want to be excited for this. I want more Marvel games as fun and well-made as Spider-Man PS4. And while I think the story may be on par with Spider-Man, I mean, that game was really fun to play. 
and I have no idea what this game plays like. I love Crystal Dynamics, and while this reveal was entertaining, I'm just not super on board with this game quite yet. That was okay, uh, FF7 looks fantastic, and I'm looking forward to seeing more from Avengers, but there was not much in between. A lot of stuff we already knew about, a lot of stuff that wasn't interesting. I think people were praising this conference simply because FF7 and because it was way better than the other shows so far. It wasn't too bad, but after the beginning, not much was really that wild. Like, it's cool Final Fantasy VIII finally gets re-released, but overall, it was just fine. Well, 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 what do we have here? The company I have the most embarrassing feelings towards. Uh, well, that means I have the most predictions for Nintendo at E3 2019, uh, like Metroid Prime 5. The GameCube games will finally come to Wii U Virtual Console. DLC for Mario and Sonic at the Rio 2016 Olympic Games on Wii U. A photo emerges of Shigeru Miyamoto looking completely lost in the Epic Games booth. Uh, Doug Bowser proves his worth as the new Nintendo of America president by eating an entire ice cream sandwich in one bite on Treehouse Live. Bill Trennan is visibly impressed. I didn't have the highest expectations of this year for Nintendo. I was just hoping to be entertained. Uh, there were enough games that we knew about heading into E3 that I just wanted to see more on. Link's Awakening, Luigi's Mansion 3, finally seeing Animal Crossing, a new Smash Brothers DLC character, come on. Just getting all those plus two or three brand new games, I'd be content with that. We start things off with the new Smash Brothers DLC character, this being... Damn it. All right, so the hero from Dragon Quest XI makes his way into Smash Brothers. I'm perfectly fine with Dragon Quest representation in Smash. I think the series is beloved, respected, influenced countless franchises, and is pretty much the de facto JRPG series next to Final Fantasy. I think it just makes sense for Dragon Quest to get a character in Smash Brothers. But after we got the mind fuck of Joker from Persona 5 as the first DLC character, I was kind of expecting something a little wilder than Dragon Quest. The hero is one of the driest possible DLC picks they could have made. I'm happy he's in, but it's not this thing where, oh my god, who could have predicted this? Everybody was saying Erdrick from Dragon Quest 3 was going to be the pick for Smash Brothers, but no, the default costume is the Luminary from Eleven, and then the various other protagonists throughout the series are alternate costumes, including Erdrick. Like I said, I'm cool with the Dragon Quest character, it's just not that exciting. We immediately go into, oh come on, how many damn times do I have to watch a trailer for a game that's been out since 2017? Yoshiaki Koizumi is here alongside Doug Bowser's first appearance in a Nintendo Direct as president of NOA. Uh, they make a little joke about his last name being Bowser, I like that and we move into Luigi's Mansion 3. Holy sh! This looks way better now! After seeing it at E3, I'm legitimately excited about 3. The first trailer just didn't look that great, but now the lighting, the shadows, the color, the textures, the detail, everything just reeks of polish. This looks like a game from 2019, and the new gameplay mechanics they detailed look stupid enjoyable. A slamming a ghost around, using Guiji to get past obstacles, great stuff. It's also nice to see a lot more characters with personality and unique designs compared to Dark Moon. Luigi's Mansion 3, is legitimately looking incredibly promising so far. Now I know what you're saying, Luigi's Mansion 3 looks pretty good, but I want a tactical game based on Jim Henson's Dark Crystal. What the hell is wrong with you? I have no idea why they decided to showcase this game. It's based off of a Netflix series, based off of this cult classic movie from the 80s. It looks okay, but why they show this, I just don't really get. The Link's Awakening remake looks precious. I'm so pumped to play this. I loved what I played with the original, and I can't wait to just fiddle around with this game. It's so beautiful. The music is fantastic. And while it seems to be an incredibly faithful remake, they're doing some interesting new stuff, like remixing your own dungeon. Trials of Mana is getting a remake. Now, if you're like me, you probably asked, what the hell is a Trials of Mana? I thought this was a new Mana game at first, but no, this is a full 3D remake of Seiken Densetsu 3, the sequel to Secret of Mana we never got outside of Japan. And that fully set in when they revealed the collection of mana featuring the original Trials of Mana is getting localized here. That is huge! I am very happy about that. Not only can people outside of Japan finally play Seiken Densetsu 3 in English, but it's remade as well, and it looks a hell of a lot better than the Secret of Mana remake. I refuse to play The Witcher 3 in anything above 720p, so The Witcher 3 Complete Edition on Switch was a nice announcement. Oh really, I'm super happy to see such a huge open world game come to Switch, especially when it's only a couple of years old. From the gameplay footage, I've seen, it's obviously graphically downgraded, but it still looks pretty tolerable. And the fact they were able to squish this entire thing on a Switch game card is the feel-good story of the year. Meanwhile, at Capcom, they couldn't fit two Resident Evil games from the early 2000s on one card. Fire Emblem Three Houses, no gameplay, it comes out in a month and a half, say it with me now. It looks fine. So they build up this Resident Evil trailer, uh, these people are playing the Resident Evil 1 remake, which is already available to play on Switch in a spooky house for about a minute, and then they reveal Resident Evil 5 and 6 for the system. 
There are multiple things I just don't understand here. Uh, why was this a commercial for Resident Evil 1 and then they say, hey, 5 and 6 are coming? Plus, this feels like a weird thing to highlight in the big E3 presentation. The fact that two old Resident Evil games are coming to the system, especially 5 and 6. Uh, 5 is generally well received, while 6 is Resident Evil 6. Really confusing, especially considering Capcom just kind of announced RE1, 0, and 4 on their own time with no Nintendo Direct, but then 5 and 6 are announced at E3. That's just weird to me. Next trailer plays, it looks like Astral Chain or something. Uh, what the hell? All right, no more Heroes 3. Hell yeah, what a reveal. Contra Rogue Corpse. I gotta be honest, this looks like garbage. It's been almost a decade since the last Contra game, and the first one since then is a 3D overhead shooter. Yeah, that's what people wanted. At least Contra Anniversary Collection was thrown on the eShop right after the Direct. Uh, Damon X Machina, this game has been a part of what? Like, four Nintendo Directs at this point, and how many people do you hear not talking about it? Well, to answer that question, I looked up the population of the world. A Panzer Dragoon remake, it actually looks really nice. I have no idea why my first thought was, fuck, they're bringing back Lair? And then two seconds later, I was like, oh yeah, it's Panzer Dragoon, jeez. Either way, it's good to see this back. Pokemon Sword and Shield. We got info about these games a week before E3. I hate when Nintendo wastes time on games they already talked about elsewhere. Next game. Astral Chain, looking pretty solid. I enjoy Platinum games from time to time. I'm not as invested into them as a lot of other people are, but I will say, this is looking pretty slick. Empire of Sin, watch any live reaction to this Nintendo Direct and everybody does the same thing. Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3. It looks fine. Actually, no, I'm fine with saying, I don't think this game looks all too great. It looks really low budget and nothing special. It looks like a Wii game. It's cool that Nintendo resurrected the series, but it baffles me that they decided to put time and effort into resurrecting this series out of all series. Guinness Viral gets a release date of right after E3. I'm eager to try this out, a rhythm adventure game in the Zelda universe. I definitely want to give the original Crypt of the Necro Dancer a go as well. Mario and Sonic at the Tokyo 2020 Olympic Games actually looks pretty good. The Wii U entries were garbage, who cares, but this one looks like they put some solid DLC into it and I'm digging what I'm seeing so far. And then finally, after waiting for over a decade, we get to see a traditional new Animal Crossing on a home console. F this. Yeah, it got delayed to 2020, but Animal Crossing New Horizons looks really damn good. They're actively changing a fair amount of stuff with the series, but not in bad ways. They're adding things people have been begging for for ages, and honestly, I think I can wait till March to play this. It'll probably be worth the wait. A bit of a sizzle reel showing a bunch of Switch titles coming soon. Spyro Reignited Trilogy, Alien Isolation, Nino Kuni, Super Lucky's Tale, what? Okay, we're getting another Smash Brothers reveal. Uh, this is a reprise of the King K. Rule trailer. I assume this is gonna be like Dixie Con or something. Ah! 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 Holy sh! Banjo Kazooie is in Smash Brothers. This is amazing. A Microsoft characters in Smash Brothers. Everybody was speculating three Microsoft characters: Steve from Minecraft, Master Chief, or Banjo Kazooie. I would have been fine with any of them. I'm definitely more into Banjo out of all these franchises, but I was personally rooting for Master Chief just because he's the Xbox guy. So while Banjo Kazooie would have made me happier, Master Chief would have been like this insane gaming moment. Banjo's kind of more of an us Nintendo fans thing, but. God, I'm so happy. This was such an incredible moment. Banjo and Kazooie look so damn good. I keep rewatching this trailer. It's so nice to see these characters back on a Nintendo console. I hope this means we get stuff like a new Banjo game, but this alone is just beautiful. They could have ended right there, but oh my god. I mean, of course they were gonna make a sequel to Breath of the Wild, but I was expecting if it was ever going to happen, they were going to announce it in 2020, but here we are. Breath of the Wild is one of my favorite games of all time. I'm very excited. Look, potentially Ganondorf's rotting body. This is the best. So yeah, Nintendo definitely won E3. Uh, the middle of the Direct definitely dragged a bit with your Damon X Machinas, Marvel Ultimate Alliance 3's Fire Emblem Three Houses, that game nobody saw any value in, but it started and ended way too strong to give it anything below a three. In fact, I'm feeling generous. It gets an extra point for this, this, and this. That was a bad E3. Nintendo was good, Microsoft was okay, but without Sony, it really felt like something was missing here. People always say how E3 is dying and companies don't take it as seriously anymore. And while I feel like statements like that are exaggerated a bit, this year definitely made the old E3 is dying suspicion feel more true than ever. I hope it's just because Microsoft and Sony are preparing to go into the next generation, but regardless, man, this E3 was pretty raw. Hopefully E3 2020, uh, more companies don't drop out because worst case scenario, we'll just have Microsoft, uh, Ubisoft, and like, DiGiorno. Hey all, Scott here. Let's do some math. 
0.21% of gamers watch gaming presentations. That's just a fact. They like getting new game reviews thrown in their faces. Now, twice as many watch E3, the biggest time of year for gaming news. It's all about seeing all these games you've never even dreamt of before. That's the point. Now, we remove the point and we get E3 2021. Oh, look, it's my favorite time of year to be pissed. After an event like E3 2019, anything was possible. Anything. So E3 2020 didn't happen because of the Molluscum outbreak. Many assumed it wouldn't be back for 2021, but those people didn't take not that into consideration. E3 2021 occurred as a virtual event, huge different from other years. No live press conferences with large audiences, just pre-packaged video showcases. They get the same gist as the press conferences across, we just don't have the life of the party. Much like with 2019, Sony wasn't participating and EA does their own thing separate from E3, but instead of it occurring the week before, it's a month later. Well at least Verizon's here. As per usual, I'll be taking a look at each major company's showcase and rating them on a scale of one to five knee slaps, starting with the Ubisoft Ford event on June 12th. Ready. Ubisoft press conferences are like sponges. Why would you watch it? Ubisoft never really clicks with me a whole lot. And no matter how good their best games are, they never really reach the heights of other companies in my opinion. And I don't really see any massive Ubisoft only fans out there. I only saw two tattoos. But this Ubisoft Ford event likes to act like the person watching cares about everything Ubisoft puts out. Like you played Family Feud. All right, so what's up first? The 42nd Tom Clancy game this year? Oh, E3 is back! Rainbow Six Extraction. You know, I could fake it and say how this seems like an interesting direction for Rainbow Six, focusing on more supernatural alien type creatures. I'm excited to see more. Or I could be honest. F off, Tom Clancy. Does anybody else feel like within the past four years, Ubisoft has been going way too hard with the Tom Clancy games? Like most of them sell well, but I have never stared a Tom Clancy fan in the eye. And if I, one lone gamer, doesn't care about something in an E3 showcase, that means it's filler, it's unneeded, and shouldn't exist, and E3 is ruined. I'm very reasonable. So Ubisoft is adding this little flavored text to each of their titles now, a Ubisoft original. Like that means anything. Gameplay is shown and it looks a whole lot worse than that CGI trailer. I'm sure the game is fine, it's just another Tom Clancy game to me, and Ubisoft already announced like four of them yesterday. But oh boy, I can't wait for the next Mario Party. A new Rocksmith title, Rocksmith Plus. This one's a subscription service, and it's all about teaching you how to play guitar, and I can commend that. I think the subscription service model's annoying, but it makes sense from a business perspective for this kind of thing. I respect this. Overall, I give Rocksmith Plus a hat tilt. Riders Republic, this is a fun looking extreme sports title. All different kinds of ways to race. You can explore this really good looking environment. I haven't been bored in 10 minutes. Oh! Yes! You know, after hearing about Rainbow Six, I thought to myself, what about Rainbow Six? Crossplay was announced for Rainbow Six Siege between PC players and Google Stadia and Amazon Luna. You're doing God's work. While Rainbow Six Siege players begged Ubisoft, guys, please, Crossplay, I want to play with the boys on Google Stadia. Of course, console crossplay comes later down the line. Here's a DLC trailer, then one of the hosts says how new games aren't the only things to be excited about this year. Didn't this release six years ago? Tons of updates are coming to already released games. Always nice to know, but not that exciting at E3 though, honestly. But at least they ended the update montage saying they're continuing to support a Tom Clancy Ghost Recon game. God, I was getting worried. Just Dance is back! Did it ever leave? Why does Ubisoft make Just Dance a part of their conference every year, but refuse to admit they made Uno? Like, they make all these games. It may not be great, but I would have gladly taken a trailer for the Monopoly game they published compared to this year's Just Dance. They don't do anything new. There's never any real announcement here. It's just, Just Dance is coming this year. Yeah, I know. I got the alert, too. It's time to get our Viking on. Oh, sh**. Updates coming to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Again, like I said, this is good to know. Like, I like seeing these games continue to get support. However, it's not that exciting, especially if you aren't playing the game. E3 is when more than just your core fans are watching, and I just don't feel like talking about updates like this really makes anybody go, wow, I'm in. These feel better safe for like, an April Ubisoft Ford or a July one. When everybody is watching you and you end up talking about what's coming to an Assassin's Creed game where if they didn't buy it already, nothing you say here is probably ever going to convince them to buy it. I just feel like you're wasting everybody's time. Save this stuff for events outside of E3. Can't wait to see that new Smash Brothers character. But look at the films and TV series Ubisoft is working on. The show Mythic Quest and the film Werewolves Within based on the game I've never heard of. Apparently it's a VR multiplayer game from 2015. So that gets a movie, but not Rayman Advance. Far Cry 6, you know, I enjoy Far Cry 
Cry, they're almost always well-made games. This is just similar to Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon. It's almost always here. Just the fact we're up to six, and that's not even counting the side games like Primal and New Dawn. It's just not that exciting to get a new Far Cry anymore. This one still looks quality, though. The character models look kind of off sometimes. But they had the season pass announcement at the end, showing the villains from previous games and the fact that Far Cry 3's expansion Blood Dragon will be included in some capacity. Surprised they didn't announce Far Cry 7. Then we move into the next announcement. Ubisoft f off with Tom Clancy. Mario plus Rabbids is getting a sequel. Now, this was leaked just the day beforehand on Nintendo's website, but this is pretty neat nonetheless. Sparks of Hope looks like a legitimate upgrade in every way, visual and scope-wise. It's obviously more ambitious. However, this does seem like a weird game to blossom into a series. As a goofy one-off that surprised everybody with its quality, yeah, for a sequel, this does still need to prove itself a bit more to me personally. The trailer seemed awfully nonchalant. Like, yeah, this is happening again. I think it might've been cooler to me to see Ubisoft tackle another series of Nintendos for a crossover with the Rabbids, or just if they revealed a bit more, but it looks good and the developers are always a treat to listen to. The Nintendo segment is over. All right. I hate Ubisoft. One final announcement. It must be big. Big enough to not show gameplay. Avatar. Well, that kind of stunk. It's a well done trailer, I guess, but there's only so much of a trailer I can watch after I realize it's an Avatar game for me to care if you're not going to show the damn game. Well, Ubisoft was Ubisoft. Can't say that was anything I didn't expect, but can't say that made me excited to tell my parents what I did the past hour. Just nothing that interesting, nothing horrendous. It was just kind of boring. Even with Mario plus Rabbids, that was the highlight of the show and it getting leaked beforehand definitely deflated it a bit. But this crossover isn't nearly as mind blowing as it was when it was first announced. Doing it a second time, well, cool. I'm happy it's here isn't blowing me away. I went into this wanting to be the third tattoo, but I'll save this patch of skin for Verizon. What's next on the schedule? Gearbox? Surely they will save E3. Was anybody really expecting anything from this? There are certain companies, when I see they're doing an E3 show, I run. Gearbox talked about the Borderlands movie coming up, said Homeworld 3 was in production. So that was a big deal in, you know, the late 90s. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands, a Borderlands spin-off. Uh, Homeworld 3 is still in production. Here we are years later, and we keep looking at like, well, Homeworld 3, this has to happen. Drives of Midgard is coming in July. Godfall, the PS5 exclusive launch title that could only run on PS5. Damn it, they pushed through and got it to work on PS4. Then we finish with talking to Kevin Hart about nothing. But is Homeworld 3 in production? Uh, it's not a prequel, it's not a remaster. It's Homeworld 3, it is the next Homeworld. I think they're trying to tell us something. So I can already kind of tell what some companies are doing here. They wouldn't normally do a press conference, but because this is all virtual, they're displaying the games they would have brought to E3. You know, the stuff playable at the show. They may not have anything worthy of a press conference here, but hey, at least Homeworld 3 is in production. The Xbox and Bethesda Showcase. I prefer Xbox and Friends. This took place on June 13th and is the first E3 show after Microsoft bought Bethesda. The first E3 show after Microsoft launched their next generation of Xbox consoles, the Xbox Series X and S. This is a big E3 for Microsoft, which is what we say about every E3, but, but this is actually big. And what better way to usher in such a big event than to show off their new mascot? Todd Howard. Starfield from Bethesda. Well, I got announced back at E3 2018. All that trailer really showed us was it was a Bethesda game in space. What year is it? Yes, after years of waiting, Starfield to me is still a Bethesda game in space. Like that sandwich, I don't know how to describe it. That's a Fallout sandwich. It just looks straight out of Fallout. The game looks like Fallout in space. Of course, that's without seeing gameplay because we didn't, but the art design, everything, it does feel like Bethesda through and through, and it's coming out in late 2022. See you next year. Stalker 2. Son of a bitch. Ah, this game looks incredible visually. Honestly, something that seems to be only possible on newer hardware. It's seriously impressive. Back for Blood. Oh, what are you guys doing? You're ruining the Back for Blood press conference. There's always going to be Verizon. Xbox Game Studios presents, in partnership with Avalanche, a co-op open world. Contraband. 
Well, if Konami's not gonna do it. Well, that was a nothing trailer. I mean, Microsoft has been announcing loads of games lately, but they almost always have nothing to show of them. And if they're not in a pre-established franchise, I'm sorry, it's hard for me to get excited without seeing gameplay. A Sea of Thieves update featuring Pirates of the Caribbean? That's pretty cute, I'll buy five Xboxes. An ad for the entire Yakuza series on Xbox Game Pass, but it's been a thing for a while now. This is the announcement of the latest game being available on the service today. Cool. I mean, Xbox Game Pass adds games every two minutes, so if they talk about how they're adding games to the service at E3, it's not like, oh my god, what? That also may be because I've been paying for this service for 36 months and I've turned on my Xbox four times since. Battlefield 2042 gameplay. I'm gonna be honest, this was one of the best gameplay trailers from E3 I've seen. No need for fancy CGI that makes you go, wow, they must really care if they're lying to me. Just really exciting gameplay. This all looks excellent doesn't mean I'm gonna play it. 12 minutes, this was shown at Microsoft's E3 2019 conference and this pretty much tells me the exact same thing. Psychonauts 2 is always a pleasure to see for the 12th time. More Bethesda games are coming to Game Pass. They weren't there already? Well, this is where the Bethesda juice is kicking in. It's time for updates on their garbage. Fallout 76 and the Elder Scrolls Online updates. I always win E3 bingo. Party Animals, a multiplayer battle arena type game between all kinds of characters with snouts. I can tell this game was added to the lineup to help Microsoft meet the quota. Hades is coming to Xbox, that's great to see. It's always surprising this game wasn't on anything but Switch and PSC for the longest time, but it definitely deserves to be played by all. Uh, you ever have those games from press conferences that you completely forgot about? Somerville is coming. Then we have this big segment about Halo Infinite, showing a bit more of the story in multiplayer. The game was delayed from a 2020 launch into holiday 2021, and being honest here, the original gameplay they showed, I, I thought it looked pretty all right. Visually, it wasn't impressive, but it wasn't bad. But the delay was obviously the right move as the game looks substantially better, and this is shaping up to be a solid title. Oh, and it's gonna have an epic campaign. Diablo 2 Resurrected, great remake with tons of value here. But where are the rats? A Plague Tale Requiem, holy shit. I never thought about what next gen could do for rat tech. Far Cry 6, because I was begging to see more. Far Cry has a strange tendency to have a super serious trailer like at the Ubisoft Ford, and then the next trailer is like, whoa, f my grandpa, dumbass. Slime Rancher 2, Xbox. Here we have a snowboarding game, Shredders. Now, this is cool because we just don't get snowboarding games like we used to. The problem is all this trailer did was show snowboarding. That's reassuring. But what makes this game unique? What makes it different? Because this new console can display up to 40K rats. There's no excuse. Atomic Heart, this looks like a wild game. I just didn't know what I was looking at half the time. Replace, this has this sprite-based art style with crazy lighting and depth and all that. It truly looks stunning. Grounded gets an update, Among Us is coming to Xbox, a Yudin Chronicle, the spiritual successor to Suikoden. See, Microsoft likes to throw in games and make everybody go, but your Xbox. The Ascent, uh, pretty much any co-op game in this angled top-down style, I don't know why, it's usually an automatic turn-off for me. I have very specific turn-ons. Age of Empires 4 for PC, then The Outer Worlds 2 is announced via a tongue-in-cheek trailer poking fun at the fact it's being announced too early. I think that's great, but it does highlight my biggest problem with Xbox right now. Raise your hand if you remember the name of the new game by Avalon announced in this press conference. Come on, I was trying to make a point. They are non-stop announcing games too early with nothing to show and it's just getting irritating at this point. Microsoft Flight Simulator is coming to Xbox Series X and S, which is great. This game looks super cool and to have it on something other than a PC, which for some reason I just can't use, will be awesome. Forza Horizon 5. Yeah, that got announced and will release before the next mainline Forza Motorsport, which was announced in 2020, and the next Fable game, which is being made by the same developer as Forza Horizon 5. Because my god, logic makes sense. Horizon 5 looks gorgeous. Set in Mexico, they have nailed every little detail, but card games like this just always look the same to me graphically. I still think a Forza from five years back looks fantastic. So there's only so much more they can constantly improve on. Phil Spencer comes out. Phil, thanks for the rats. And things out on Redfall, a vampire co-op shooter by Arcane and Bethesda. Thank you. Well, that's over. It's an odd game to end things out on, no gameplay or anything. If I would compare the idea of this to anything, it's like Left 4 Dead, but with fangs. And they already showed Left 4 Dead's spiritual successor in this presentation with Back for Blood, so it's like, why act like this is the one game to end it all with? There were a good few games they showed in this presentation I think would have made for a better closer. Well, that was Xbox. The general consensus online was that was a great show. My opinion's a little lower, and I've had this mentality with Xbox for quite a few years now. Xbox has rarely had a bad press conference. Even their worst ones from the Kinect days, those are treasures. When an Xbox showcase is bad, it's glorious. When it's good, 
it's kind of just generically good to me. They almost always tout how this is the largest and most diverse lineup in Xbox history, saying we're gonna show you 50 games, but 40 of them you've already seen and are just completely random out of nowhere titles you're gonna forget about in five minutes. I always feel like Xbox showcases games that are kind of the table scraps from what Nintendo and Sony aren't showcasing in their presentations, but they are making great strides with exclusive games. Just so many of them are just CGI trailers. We have nothing to go off of. We know Fable and Perfect Dark and Hellblade 2 and Everwild and The Outer Worlds 2 and State of Decay 3 and Contraband and Redfall and Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6 are coming out, but we basically know nothing and just have CGI trailers of them, and I'm just sick of it. And Bethesda really didn't have much going on here. Like, if Xbox didn't purchase them and they had their own press conference, what the hell would they show? But Xbox Game Pass was pushed heavily here, with most of the games being slated to be a part of the service, which is fantastic. Overall, Xbox, as usual, had a good one here. It's just... it didn't make me feel anything. It was mostly stuff I fully expected and nothing that crazy, but it was pretty alright. Square Enix held their Square Enix Presents less than an hour after Xbox. Well, that doesn't give me much time to recover. I can only be so lukewarm. I get really tired after seeing something okay. Well, Square's presentation starts off with the reveal of a new game by Eidos Montreal, Guardians of the Galaxy. Please tell me more for two hours. So Square Enix published the Marvel's Avengers game, which wasn't really what a lot of people wanted. Thus, the idea of them doing another Marvel game isn't all too thrilling. However, this one, looks pretty good. Guardians just seems to be a well-made single-player adventure. Solid visuals, voice acting, the gameplay looks decent enough. I think this will be a quality game. This demo wouldn't end. I think this game would have left a far greater impact if it was just a trailer in the Xbox showcase. But after this was all done, they announced the Final Fantasy Pixel Remasters. They're re-releasing the first six Final Fantasy games on platforms that already have most of them. Square Enix fans, does this ever happen to you? <laughs> All right, listen, I get it. Square likes to release a lot of their old games on PC and mobile. Sometimes it feels like they do it there first as a test, but why aren't these on consoles right now? They were console games. The consoles currently don't have any means of playing any of these games. Mobile platforms have all these games already. You can play one through six on smartphones right now and PC has four of them. What the hell is the point of any of this? Legend of Mana's opening cutscene is played. Uh, Avengers get some updates. A ton of mobile games are detailed because the E3 audience loves it. Square, my fingers are too dirty to play mobile games. Babylon's Fall is shown, a Platinum Games production. It's a live games as a service title and looks like ass. I'm sold. A ton on Life is Strange, a remaster collection, then the next entry, True Colors. And Life is Strange is something that you're either into or you're not, and no trailer for any game in the series is ever going to convince you otherwise. Then, one final game, a new Final Fantasy spin-off, Stranger of Paradise Final Fantasy Origin. It's supposed to be a modern action game based on the first Final Fantasy game. This game could be anything. It doesn't feel like Final Fantasy, it looks like a generic hack and slash, like a fine way to end things, I guess. At least they showed us something new, but describing the game, an action RPG based on the world of the first Final Fantasy, my mind goes on a lot more cool places than what this trailer is. And that was the Square Enix Presents at E3. I didn't like it. What was the point of this? The more time passes, the less Square Enix seems to have it all together. They almost seem to be replicating a lot of the problems Capcom had a few years back, where they were trying so desperately to appeal to America. When in reality, if you just do what people know you for, you'll be just fine. Like who's thinking, oh, Square Enix, I want them to make Guardians of the Galaxy. I didn't think this presentation was terrible, but it was most certainly not good. There were some announcements and they weren't half bad. Guardians looks quality and I feel like Stranger of Paradise will be all right. But everything in the middle, it's like, look at the sandwich. There's pure mucus in in the middle, but the bread's okay. Yes! Guys, I'm signing up for Verizon. They're gamers too! Verizon's E3 show on June 14th. What do you think they're gonna announce? It doesn't matter. They're gamers! Verizon is one of those companies who know nothing about gaming, but they're tech-based, so they see how large gaming is, and they feel the need to jump in on the conversation. Just look at how companies like Google and Amazon talk about gaming compared to Nintendo and Sony and Microsoft. They don't get it. They always overact about gaming, trying to overcompensate to prove to people that they respect and love video games, when in reality, they know absolutely nothing about them. Gaming isn't a passion. It's a right! I don't know, maybe they'll announce the PlayStation Vita will be under Verizon, though. Well, 5G data speeds are here, and they're gonna help us do esports and develop games and watch games online. I just care so much about gaming and gamers and video games. This was an advertisement for Verizon Internet, and it was still better than Gearbox. Capcom had their showcase later that day, saying they were going to show Resident Evil Village, Monster Hunter Stories 2, The Great Ace Attorney, and an update on their fighting games. I wonder what they're gonna show. We start off with Resident Evil Village. That's a surprise. Since the game is already out, they say, 
the game is already out. Here's Monster Hunter Stories 2. Much like Resident Evil Village, this game is a thing. Monster Hunter Rise gets an update, the Grace Ace Attorney gets a trailer, then a Capcom employee explains the trailer, then eSports. What the hell was that? Half a slap. All right, so a virtual only E3. I gave Xbox a golf clap. Uh, the rest of the conferences gave me the clap. It's up to Nintendo. And Bandai Namco presents House of Ashes to save the event. Hopefully one of them shows Wario. The Nintendo Direct for E3 2021 occurred on June 15th. Of course, being the Nintendo fan I am, I was expecting utter dog shit. It's structured just like any regular Nintendo Direct, which is interesting. Normally their E3 Directs are very different pacing and style wise. The first announcement is Kazuya from Tekken is coming to Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. Fine! This is a character announcement that doesn't upset me, it's just doesn't do much for me. We already have three fighting game characters in the game in which their main gimmick is the fact they're from a fighting game. So the fourth time, it, it's not as interesting. Plus fighting game characters are constantly swapped around in crossover fighting games and Namco develops Tekken and Smash Brothers. So this doesn't feel like a, oh my God, what moment. Also Tekken was already technically represented in Smash via the Heihachi Mi costume. It doesn't mean I think it should have been the only Tekken representation. It just makes the character's inclusion a bit more underwhelming than if Tekken wasn't represented at all. I'm always happy to see new Smash characters, but I'm almost ready to see them wrap things up. Speculating who will be in Smash next has become boring to me because it almost seems like all rules for what constitutes a character have been thrown out. Anybody can make it in, which on one hand is incredibly exciting, but makes each character reveal a bit more disappointing. Like you can put any character you want in and you chose no dignity. However, this was a perfectly fine addition, just nothing that exciting to me personally. Life is Strange Remastered Collection and True Colors are coming to Switch. You know, after the 14th time we've seen these games at E3 this year, I think they finally won me over. Guardians of the Galaxy is coming to Switch. You know, after the 14th time we've seen this game at E3 this year, I think they finally won me over. Now, actually, this is a cloud version of the game. They don't make it obvious, but you see this little text at the bottom stating, buckle up, the future's here. Cloud versions aren't fun, Nintendo. It's not like, oh, they're actually bringing this game to Switch. It's they're doing the bare minimum to make this game playable on Switch. I know why they throw these games in their directs, because seeing big names like that and seeing big graphics like that get you excited at first, but then when it's revealed that it's nothing but a cloud version, the carrying me drops to sub-zero. Worms Rumble on Switch comes with an exclusive patchwork bear outfit. Where are my stock options? Astria Ascending? Sure. Two Point Campus? Double sure. So you're talking about these four games sort of rapid fire via this weird headline, there's something for everyone on Nintendo Switch. Yeah. Everyone. If the world had to pick between only four games, I think we know which ones. Super Monkey Ball Banana Mania. So this is amazing. Celebrating the 20th anniversary of the series, Banana Mania is pretty much a perfect return to form, taking 300 levels from Monkey Ball 1, 2, and Deluxe, the good ones. They did Banana Blitz HD two years back, which obviously was just to test the waters for the series. Now they're going in and giving us what we want, a good game. This seems to be the perfect Monkey Ball experience. This is great. They'll f it up somehow. Mario Party Superstars, I'm pissing happiness. Pretty much a best of collection for Mario Party with 100 classic minigames from previous entries, which is pretty much exactly what Mario Party of the Top 100 was. But in comparison, this is actually good. For some reason, they never took into consideration the glue that held Mario Party together was the game boards. And they're bringing back five game boards from the N64 titles, which is perfect. At their worst, these game boards are far better than the best modern Mario Party boards. Plus it has online play, it uses Super Mario Party's engine, which looked great. This is amazing, though I think five game boards is a really weak number. It works, but when these are remakes, I think it's fair to want more than five. I mean, Mario Party games during their peak have constantly had more than five game boards, and they were all brand new. Plus, the mini games are taken from across the entire series. The game boards are just N64, which I will remind Nintendo, the GameCube Mario Parties were pretty sexy. But honestly, that's really my only gripe with the game. I think I'd want at least eight to ten game boards, but five? It suffices. But like Monkey Ball, they'll f it up somehow. The Mario Party team are the only developers I wouldn't let perform surgery on me. Next up, they say Metroid Prime 4 is still in development. I'd be too if I didn't exist. But here's a different new Metroid game. Oh. M Metroid 5? Oh my god, a new 2D Metroid? This looks so clean! What the f Metroid Dread, after being this mysterious entity for almost 20 years, a 2D Metroid Nintendo's been teasing all that time that's been cancelled, uncancelled, cancelled again, it's happening now. And it looks good. It looks like a true evolution of 2D Metroid, and it's developed by Mercury Steam, the developers of Metroid Samus Returns, and they look like they're nailing it. It's so great to see this series get so much more support as of late, but people have to put their money where their mouth is. If they want more stuff like this and not 10 more Mario Party superstars, 
buy it. If you don't, damn it, I will. Another platter of games here. Uh, Just Dance 2022. It really blindsided me with that one. Cruise and Bless, that's cool. And it. Who's heard of a sizzle reel of two things? Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. Man, what gives this more value to have its own headline compared to the others? Mario Golf Super Rush comes out in two minutes. I hate when Nintendo spends time at E3 on games releasing so soon, but they did reveal free updates are coming. <sighs> That sort of means to me this game is launching in an incomplete state and it'll be finished via free updates. And by the time they fully finish the game, I'm not gonna care. Monster Hunter Stories 2 gets a highlight. More evidence that I think Capcom did the show at gunpoint. What well, was the point talking about Monster Hunter on their own when Nintendo was gonna anyways? WarioWare is back! Hell yes! This one focuses on playing as the actual WarioWare characters in the micro games, each with their own abilities. So there are multiple ways to complete each micro game, which is a really cool idea. I am a bit cautious though. I'm worried this format limits how crazy the micro games can be. Look at why you wear smooth moves that game goes wild with the Wii remote and I've always felt the switch was a prime candidate for why you wear with the joy-con instead at the moment this is something that could have been done on any Nintendo platform though it is a cool idea and I'm gonna pick it up I'm just interested to see how much variety this concept brings with it Shimigami Tensei 5 I blacked out seriously though this is a huge upgrade from Shimigami Tensei 4 in the 3DS and it's genuinely looking to be another solid RPG to call the Nintendo Switch its home the Danganronpa series comes to Switch alongside Fatal Frame Made in a Black Water the Wii U Fatal Frame I just bought the insanely expensive European physical edition and my dreams of becoming a financial advisor are crumbling so I played this one a bit and it wasn't really my thing but I'm willing to give it another go on Switch uh, weirdly enough it's coming to all platforms again so happy I invested in what I thought was going to be the only way to ever play this game the first part of Doom Eternal DLC comes roughly four years too late. Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 1 and 2, which is a great game for Switch, even if the graphics are looking a little rough. Strange Brigade. I remember them announcing this game too. That's right, even my mom came up to me and said, did you see they announced Strange Brigade for Switch? Mario Plus Rabbit Sparks of Hope! Again! Advance Wars 1 Plus 2 Reboot Camp. Oh my god, this is so nice to see. Even if you're not a fan of Advance Wars, this game gives loads of hope that Nintendo is really willing to revisit fan favorite franchises. It's a remake of the two games on Game Boy Advance, and I would have preferred if they remade the games exclusive to Japan. But I think the game looks gorgeous. The 2D and 3D art are both amazing. It's just a warm and fuzzy feeling to see this franchise back in some way. Now, it's time for some Zelda talk. Skyward Sword HD is coming out. What a headline! They talked about about nothing new, and this was quite possibly my biggest disappointment of the show. Skyward Sword HD seems to basically be adding nothing. They had nothing of note to discuss, no enhancements, no changes, no quality of life improvements. It's just Skyward Sword in HD. You can play with buns if you want. Compared to Wind Waker HD and Twilight Princess HD, this is a huge disappointment of a remaster, even graphically. With those, they went in and spruced up a ton. Skyward Sword HD, looks like you're just playing Skyward Sword on an emulator. As all the Game & Watch is revealed, it's pretty much the exact same thing as the Mario Game & Watch release for Mario's 35th anniversary, except this one includes Zelda 1, 2, Link's Awakening, and a reskin of the Game & Watch game Vermin. It's cute, but they said this was pretty much it for Zelda's 35th anniversary, which feels really strange. Like, this is all you're willing to do? Reusing Game & Watch shells and giving us a 30th way to play Zelda 1? I like this kind of junk, but it doesn't really get me going, especially after we already got the Mario one. This isn't a new form factor or anything, so it's not like, oh boy, I can't wait to see what this device is gonna be like. But we finally end on a look at the sequel to The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. It's a sequel to Breath of the Wild. Lots of new stuff at play here, specifically the sky, what looks like time manipulation, goo. Truly a fantastic looking game but they still gotta be hiding this game's main gimmick. The title is yet to be revealed, and Nintendo says they don't wanna say what it is because it'll spoil something, so there's obviously a lot they aren't sharing. And with the release date of 2022 and what I think will be late 2022, we'll be speculating for a while. That was pretty good. Some weird choices for games shown and the oddball scissor reels of there's so much to play on Nintendo Switch. But overall, some great stuff here. While watching, this was a treat. Looking back, there aren't a ton of big games, but games that we've wanted for a while. Advance Wars, WarioWare, a good Mario Party, Metroid Dread. Not the best Nintendo E3, but a damn good one. But who knows, Verizon might have buttered me up. So that was E3 2021. As each day went on, Ubisoft show kept getting better and better. Most companies are treating E3 as more so an excuse to give updates on their well-being rather than putting together a show that'll blow gamers' minds. Nintendo seems to have a really solid idea as to what constitutes as an ending announcement or 
a big announcement in general, the other companies sort of falter with that kind of stuff. Like Capcom show was completely unnecessary, same with Gearbox, Square Enix. I've just hated companies putting together showcases when they have no reason to. You're wasting your fans' time. I think E3 went to all these companies and almost begged them to do something this year, being a virtual event. Let's be honest, there's no real need for these companies to even participate in E3. Like, what are they even participating in? Live streaming their showcase at a certain time? They can do that whenever. E3 still has value because more people were watching something like the Square and Capcom shows because they were a part of E3. If they weren't, not nearly as many people would even tune in. But when this is the overall quality, E3 becomes more and more questionable. At least Xbox and Nintendo were good, and those are the main ones you look forward to. But without Sony, even without EA, without those big booths and not treating each showcase as the company is putting their best foot forward and trying to win everybody over, instead giving updates on your esports initiatives or DLC plans, E3 just didn't feel worth it this year. But I still wouldn't trade it for the world. Even at its worst, E3 is our time. It's a communal effort to band together to say, wow, didn't that stink? I don't like having all these showcases spread out across the summer. One week of just nonstop gaming talk, it's magical. No matter how many times it disappoints me, I'm always gonna look forward to the next E3. There's always next year, Verizon. I'm looking forward to their showcase at E3 2022, where I pray they announce their new logo and it looks like this. I sneezed during the tattoo.